um, when both schools are done, we'd love to shake your hands and um, have a little gift for you and probably take a picture. So make sure you stick around and then you're absolutely families free to leave if you don't want to stay for the rest of the board meeting. Okay, Homeschool Academy, Mr. Wilburn, this is your school. It is had a wonderful visit at Homeschool Academy this week. And I've lost my notes. Tonight we have Homeschool Academy and Aspen Valley Campus here for our board spotlight. If you could all, oh wait, you already did this part, excuse me. I was unprepared because I was busy carbo loading. I'm missing a page. No, here we go. Okay, my bad. No, it's it's right here. I got it. No, that's this is all your fault, team. You put it at the back page. You put it in back of in front. It's your fault. Homeschool Academy is a kindergarten through twelfth grade program offering musical theater, STEAM, and space science, concurrent enrollment, and outdoor enrichment education. They had 599 students at October count, and I learned this week that 599 is growing to 655 next year. Doing a great job. Jolyn Patterson was the original founder of the program. Please welcome Principal Tori Ritchie. Mr. Wilborn, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Haber, thank you for having us tonight. And so the plan is I'm just going to do a little bit more there of what Mr. Wilborn was doing, talking about our programs. Then I have uh, three teachers that I'm going to hand off to the various programs, and there is going to be some singing. And so just get your eardrums ready for that. OK, so um, so yeah, we're a K-12 program. We do uh, enrichment. Uh, we do concurrent enrollment at the top. We do have classes uh, in the STEAM area. We have classes in musical theater, and we have a one room schoolhouse over at School in the Woods it's called Tracks. And so we have kids that are Monday through Friday. And so it's that one out there is third grade through eighth grade. And then the rest of us is K, K through 12. So we offer a little bit of everything. Uh, we partner with the Space Foundation. We partner with lots of different groups. Uh, we are performing our musical theater groups. We had a K3 uh, performance. This 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 K3 musical was done this week. Uh, our 4-8 and our 9-12 are going to be performing later, and I'll, I won't steal their thunder and let them tell you about that and where that's at. Um, it's been great, a great privilege uh, to be the principal of this program. I'm glad I got to do it for the last four years, and I'm excited to uh, be handing it off to, to a person that looks really, really great and on paper and seems like a great person and seems like uh, she's done some good stuff here in D20 before. So I'm excited to hand off the baton to Keisha and uh, let her start rocking and rolling with the team. But for tonight, uh, I'm going to go ahead and the first person I'm going to introduce is Katrina Parks, who runs our space science class and a STEAM class for the, at the middle school level, and she's going to to tell you what she's doing here. Thank you. Oh, oh okay. Um, <laughs> um, now you're going to be off pace. Okay. Um, Challenger Learning Center, we do two missions there and do an e-mission in our classroom. And I just really want to give a shout out to them because they are a free resource for us, which is huge. We also spend many days at Space Foundation and we have guest speakers from the Mobile Earth and Space Observatory, USAFA, and we also spend a day at Pearson Space Force Space um, Starbase. So we're out of the classroom more than we're in the classroom for our space program. Um, we are a K through eight STEM program Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and this is just an example of an engineering by design project that my students did these last couple of weeks um, in a hydraulic marble maze. And so it was um, it was a fun engineering design project. All right, uh, next up is Marion Nagel. She's going to talk to you about the two programs she oversees. Hi, I'm Marion Nagel, and I teach at the Tracks program, which is out in School in the Woods. Um, we were very muddy today playing kickball out in the snow and um, today what we're going to do is show you a little bit of Beauty and the Beast which is the performance we're going to do and I think it'd be a lot more fun if they do their thing instead of me talking so let's have them perform.
know what this is based on. Dismissed, rejected, publicly humiliated. More than I can bear. Bear? Where? Oh, look, boom. I'm disgraced. Who? You never. Gaston, you've got to pull yourself together. Gosh, deserves me to see you, Gaston, looking so down in the dumps. Love to be you, Gaston, even when taking your lumps. There's no way to find you. You're everyone's favorite guy. Everyone's on and inspired by you. And it's not very hard to see why. On. No one's next dancing friend, I'll please the countdown. But there's no man in town half as manly. Perfect job, your are gone. You can't have that topic for Stanley. And they'll tell you whose team they prefer to be on. No one's been like Gaston, a king pen like Gaston. As a specimen, yes, I'm intimidating. I'm gonna get that guest on. Okay, next up uh, is going to be our 9th through 12th musical group, and Miss Kirk is going to be leading the charge in that. And we got some students here for that as well over there, and uh, they're going to be going and doing their thing here. Okay, I'm just um, sorry, trying to get the right track. Okay, so yes, uh, my name is Amelia Kirk, and I headed up a high school program um, at HSA for musical theater. I started it two years ago, and um, we haven't generally had a large population of high schoolers at our student at our school. Um, last year, we ended up having like 22 who performed in our musical Cinderella. This year, we got 33, and next year we're at 55. So it's just going up a lot every year. Um, so that's like one of the main things I do. And then I also help with the other um, musicals that we do. Um, I do music for four through eight and K through three. So we got a lot of musical theater going on. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this, these are uh, Hook and Smee from my per, uh, from our performance that is May fourth at the Colorado Springs School down by the Broadmoor. So I was. I had all these flyers ready to give you that I forgot, so yay, but okay, come on. <laughs> I saw the sisters who cook a cake quite large and finish they are in a crispy sweet with icing mixed with poison till it turns a tempting drink which places near the house. Just where those boys are sure to be up. As being seen, they won't care. What's in such a plot? The boys who had no mother's feet, the one future, the fairest games, won't know it's dangerous to eat. So damp and rich a cake, and soon before the winking of an eye. Those boys will eat that poison cake, and one by one, they'll die! Okay, <laughs> okay well, in the interest of keeping the 10 minutes, we, we streamlined that for you, so... Uh, we could we could have sang more for you if you wanted, but yeah. So thank you for having us here tonight. We, we're very very proud of our students. They do a great job. Uh, like you said, 599 in my registrar Kathy Messick there always keeps me up to date. I, I made her a challenge of like 6:35, and then she 
was bragging to me also that we're up to the 650 number. So, so uh, there you go. So thank you very much. We had a great time presenting for you. Have a good rest of your board meeting. And we're gonna, some of us will stick around to see any announcements you might have about certain things that might relate to us. So, okay. All right. So, all right. That's it. Thank you so much, Homeschool Academy. You guys are super amazing. So make sure you come up after Aspen Valley and we'll get to see you guys. So I'd like to introduce Aspen Valley Campus for our second spotlight. 21% of students at Aspen Valley are deemed twice exceptional, meaning they are identified gifted and talented and also have one or more learning disabilities such as dyslexia. Aspen Valley students who complete the discovery model, a concrete skill-based curriculum that has the power to create positive change in students, participate in a challenging high ropes course as a culminating activity. It is the only ASD 20 campus that can align support for seventh through 12th grades because of their combined middle school and high school campus. They have plans to launch aligned literacy and writing initiatives campus wide next school year. Two more bullet All points, right. okay. Aspen Valley is the only high school in ASD 20 developing and using a process to systematically screen, identify, and support all students with literacy needs, including students with dyslexia. Aspen Valley is the only high school with a dyslexia specialist supported by the dyslexia training program offered by ASD 20. Academy District 20 is the only district in the state of Colorado to offer such trainings to its teachers. This program involves hours of graduate level coursework and intensive supervised practice hours, all supported by the district's dyslexia trainers, Jody Champagne and Kim Fitzpatrick, two of only six or seven trainers in the state. So please welcome Principal Kyle Chamberlain. Thank you. So just to kind of set the stage just a little bit, um, our kids were like, should we sing a song after that? Like, that was awesome. Like that was awesome. So, um, but uh, we're, we are, we're, 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 you know, I was here at the last board meeting talking about some significant changes on our campus, but one of the, one of the things I really identified as the new leader uh, of this unique, cool little campus was really um, giving real dedicated support with the data to support it. Like we know we have kids that have some learning struggles. We have kids who need extension, but really how do we get to the root of what's going on? And, and as I talk to the educator who will speak after me, um, Teresa McDonough, she said, hey, I'm in this training. It's about dyslexia. I was an elementary school teacher to start my career as a literacy specialist. And that's still like foundational belief of mine with education is that if kids can't read, they're going to struggle with everything. And so Teresa brought to me this idea and had the support of, of the district folks that are that are here as well tonight. And um, I'm just super proud of the work they did. The kids are grinding through hard, hard work that a lot of students do at a very young age to learn to read at a stronger level. Um, and it's exhausting to watch, to watch these kids um, fight through um, this disability that they have because they want to improve the way that they perform and the way that they can function. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Teresa who will share, and then we have some kids who are gonna share their experience in this program. So thank you. Hi. Um, I'm here to speak with you because I grew up with dyslexia. In my case, it's not because I had it, but because my dad does. I know his story well because I was his editor and proofreader from elementary school onward. Um, he discovered that he had dyslexia because he wanted to play high school football. To play football, he needed to pass his classes, and to pass his classes, he needed to read. Despite his pride and every inclination to avoid asking for help, his desire to play football won out. After all, no pass, no play. So picture a long haired, rough around the edges, tough as nails punk kid, begrudgingly showing up for some after school help despite wanting to be anywhere else. His only goal was to do the minimum necessary to pass his classes, but he had an English teacher who also had a family member with dyslexia and she spotted the signs in my dad. So for the first time ever, as a high schooler, my dad had a name for the stupid that he felt, and more importantly, he had a solution. This teacher proceeded to work with him from the basics, learning to read letters, learning phonics, learning orthographic mapping, learning to read from the beginning. 
It wasn't a short term intervention. He continued working with this teacher for the rest of high school. He earned a football scholarship, but as it turned out, reading was more important. He blew out his knee before he could start his college football career, and he had to rely on academics instead. He went on to be successful. He's been a voracious reader for as long as I've known him, and his novels were some of the first ones that I picked up and read. So a few years later, to no one's surprise but mine, I became a teacher. And it turns out my dad's story isn't unique. Throughout my career, I've worked with kids who struggle to read. Year after year, I found that the students who had the worst behaviors in my secondary classes read well below grade level, sometimes not at all. And their numbers aren't few. Sally Shaywitz is the head researcher of the Connecticut Longitudinal Study of Dyslexia and the director for the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. She says, dyslexia is a very common problem affecting one out of every five children, 10 million in America alone. And it's estimated to comprise at least 80% of all learning disabilities. She also points out, it's obvious that schools are failing to diagnose the great majority of dyslexic students, children who could be helped. She says, this constitutes one of the great tragedies in American education in the 21st century. District 20, though, has allocated funding and focus to support children with dyslexia, especially at the elementary school level, with schools like Encompass Heights Elementary and some of the other satellite services at other schools. We have the only program in the state that trains teachers to become dyslexia therapists. I'm part of the fifth cohort of dyslexia therapist trainees. I'm the first and so far one of very few specialists operating in the secondary level, the only one in the high school. I have prior interventionist experience and advanced studies in literacy and linguistics. So I've been able to launch a program at Aspen Valley uh, with the help of trainers, Jody Champagne and Kim Fitzpatrick. I've worked with Kate Motley, one of the literacy TOSAs to develop a universal screening protocol for our school. Using this process, we can identify students who have indicators of dyslexia, we can further screen them, and then we can support them. It's a time intensive process, and I'm grateful to have the support of the district's literacy team. I've also been able to integrate and supplement the take flight curriculum used by other campuses to meet the needs of high school students. We built this into our school day by offering the curriculum during a reading lab course. I'm also currently working with Tosa Kate Mothley and Literacy Director Andy Ruskin to write a proposal for a linguistics course that acknowledges the intensive study involved in dyslexia therapy and will count for a core elective for high school credit. This will help ensure high school students who need dyslexia intervention can do so without giving up needed high school credits or interrupting important extracurricular activities before and after school. We also have a really unique opportunity at Aspen Valley as a small campus to shift focus quickly and deliberately. This year, we built an awareness of how dyslexia affects students at our school and our school community. We've come to understand the prevalence of dyslexia on our campus is likely much higher than in typical populations. Initial data indicates somewhere between 30 to 50% of our students. We're also collecting data that indicates many of them are twice exceptional. That means they meet diagnostic indicators for both something like dyslexia and for giftedness. At least 21% of our students are already identified in this category. And because we're small, we get to take all this new data into account and build for the future. Next year, we're implementing literacy initiatives campus-wide. Like researchers Vicki Phillips and Karina Wong, Aspen Valley Campus will think of literacy as a spine. It holds everything else together. Vince Ferrandino and Gerald Terrozo are former presidents of the National Associations of Principals. They share that underdeveloped literacy skills are the number one reason why students are retained, assigned to special education, given long-term remedial services, and why they fail to graduate from high school. High quality classroom instruction that implements literacy instruction specifically across all content areas has been shown to close learning gaps for all students. This is especially true for those who struggle, including students with dyslexia. High quality literacy instruction and support will be a primary focus for Aspen Valley campus in the coming school year. Now, I'm privileged to work with amazing students at Aspen Valley. I'd like to introduce a few of them to you. They inspire me to do this hard work. Carter is a junior that I've known for two years. In my sophomore English class last year, his work was 
saturated with signs of dyslexia. So he's been one of our guinea pigs for the screening process and the rollout of our dyslexia program. Right. Hello, my name is Carter. I'm a student at Aspen Valley. I first heard that I was dyslexic junior year of this year. In early my early elementary school days, I was looked at differently as a kid that couldn't pronounce words right when reading. And whenever I was asked to read out loud, my heart would start to race because of nerves. A year and a half ago, I started jujitsu and I'm now a blue belt. When first starting, you learn the basic positions, mount, side control, close guard, and back take. Now this is definitely gonna take some time to learn these basics, but once you have them, you can flow between them to have good jujitsu. Just like the Scarborough's reading rope, decoding, sight recognition, and phonological awareness is the foundation needed for word reading. Without word reading, there would be no fluency nor comprehension. It's great to finally know why I have these troubles with reading and how I can get them resolved. What are your thoughts on going back to the basics? We look forward to your support. I'd like to introduce Alistair for more information. Hello, I am Alistair. I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was very young and it made me feel like I wasn't good enough while growing up. Uh, it didn't help when I was in third grade. I started to get help, but it wasn't targeted towards my dyslexia. So it helped a little, but not towards the main root of my problem. When I was in elementary, uh, third grade, I had anger issue and stress because I didn't know how to show how I felt about it because the class would move forward faster than I could keep up with. And so I would have anger outbursts and the school would hold my arms behind my back to prevent me from doing anything because I couldn't explain how I felt. Um, my parents pulled me out of school my fifth grade year to uh, so I could learn at my own pace and I could figure out different places where I needed the most help. Um, coming to Aspen Valley and working with Ms. McDonough, it helped me to uh, it helps me to read and write better, and I have seen an improvement in how I've read and my writing in general, and my spelling has gone a lot better. Um, I would thank you for letting me talk. I would like to introduce uh, Elias Mast. Hello, my name is Elias Mast. I was diagnosed with dyslexia at the age of six, and because this was homeschooled until the seventh grade. The reason I was homeschooled was to get specialized training for my dyslexia, and I cannot express enough how impactful this training has been. Even though I'm significantly impacted by my dyslexia, the dyslexic training I received enabled me to thrive. I'm a straight-A student and received the Medal of Academic Achievement in the eighth grade because of this training I received, because I was able to get help. I was Because I was able to get help, education was not a nightmare like it is for most people with dyslexia, but instead an environment for opportunities like it should be. However, very few are as fortunate. Most don't get any type of assistance for their dyslexia and because of this are left behind academically. The majority of people with dyslexia are abandoned and left behind by the very people they were told whether to teach them. But thankfully, you guys have provided an opportunity for this to change. District 20 has provided an opportunity to give the people the very same type of assistance that I received that changed my life all for the better. I know how hard being dyslexic is, but I also know how incredible it is when you get help and are able to triumph over the very things that seemed impossible earlier before. Now, don't get me wrong, dyslexia is still a daily struggle and it always will be, but it is also getting better because of the training I'm still receiving at Aspen Valley. Most of the time, high school is when dyslexia needs the most help for. And when it is not given, it leads to a great deal of self-hatred because most people see dyslexia as just a fancy name for stupid. But it is not. It is a real thing that can be helped and is thankfully beginning to be addressed. My hope for tonight is that one day, the opportunity to triumph will be available to all the students struggling with dyslexia. Thank you all so much for sharing the spotlight with us. We deeply appreciate you. Have an amazing rest of your night. So thank you all. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. And I'll say this, um, we take our struggles at Aspen Valley and our, our disabilities and things, and we turn them into superpowers. And, and these three kids who stood in front of you today, it's not easy for them. Um, and they did an exceptional job. So thank you.
We are going to take our first break real quick for about five minutes just to get to meet all of the students up close and personal. So come on up front and we'll line up. We need to catch up someday. Oh, 
We are ready to resume our meeting. Thanks again to Homeschool Academy in Aspen Valley. Okay, item. Okay, next item, approval of the agenda for the Board of Education regular meeting for April 18th, 2024. Mrs. Matson bonet are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Are there any discussion items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the, the agenda? Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Kantz? Aye. Mrs. Shandy? Aye. Mr. Wilburn? Aye. Mrs. Ginez? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Tonight our board quote will be given by Colonel Stallworth. Good evening. So tonight's board quote is uh, by Publilius Cyrus. Uh, and it says, do not despise the bottom rungs in the ascent to greatness. The journey to success is difficult and it doesn't happen overnight, but your best and most powerful lessons occur in the very beginning of your journey. So don't take them for granted. Spend some time in the trenches and you'll be a true and respected warrior. Thank you very much for that. Board comments. Does anyone have anything to share for board comments tonight? Colonel Stallworth. Thank you, appreciate it. So um, 
As we get into the uh, graduation season here, I know there are a lot of District 20 schools that are going to be uh, having um, their ceremonies on the Air Force Academy at Kloon Arena. Uh, it is a military installation, so there's a couple of things you need to understand, particularly uh, for tonight. I'm just only going to address if you're planning to have any foreign national visitors, that's individuals who their primary uh, means of communication is a passport, not necessarily a driver's license. But if you have any of those individuals, uh, you'll need to get those folks registered at the pass and registration office outside of the south gate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, otherwise, they will not be allowed onto the installation when the, your time comes to have your ceremony. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the board tonight? OK, I just have one. Next Wednesday is Administrative Professionals Day. So uh, in old fashioned terms, Secretary Day, and we have our truly amazing Board of Education Secretary, Tina. <laughs> well, she, well, she sheds a few tears. I just want to <laughs> thank her from the bottom of our hearts. There's not enough thanks we could give her because uh, she, yeah, she deals with all the stuff we deal with in more. <laughs> But when I came on two and a half years ago, I literally thought Tina had been the board secretary for years because she is so knowledgeable, so on top of everything. I mean, there's never anything missed and she just guides each of us, whether veteran or new board members, every step of the way. She knows everything that's going on, where to find every answer to every question, and we could not be successful without you. So thank you so much. Superintendent comments? Yes, so um, Mr. Smart, would you like to come to the mic? I think we have some new administrators and new staff members to um, share with us. Am I on? Yeah, yes, we do. So I know you're going to be disappointed. I only have two tonight instead of the seven I had the last time. So, um, but you know, these two are amazing. So uh, first of all, Tina, thank you. Yes, uh, she's great. And we work on the menu together, just in case you didn't know. So no more potato bars is what we've decided. OK, um, so tonight I would like to introduce Keisha Hill, who is being uh, recommended as the Homeschool Academy principal. Keisha is joined this evening by her husband, L, her daughter, Chase, her son, Xavier, and several family members online. And if they could speak, they would probably cheer right now. So. Um, they're, they're there though. And then also some other random children that she brought with her tonight. Um, actually, she's helping out her pastor by watching the, their kids for him. So that's great. I'm just going to say, I, you know, I've done a lot of interviews and I've never had somebody in an interview say, you know, I really didn't like this project I have to do. Um, but she did an amazing job on the project in the final interview. And what we do is we just point to Joe Lynn and say that was her, it's her fault. So, but she, she did great. So it was great. Um, so as far as uh, uh, Keisha's education, she holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Bilingual Elementary Education from the University of Finland or Finlay, not Finland. Um, that would be some other country. Um, she has a Master's of Arts in Adult Education and Training from the University of Phoenix. And she began her education career in, I'm going to say it hopefully right, uh, Lima, Ohio, as a third and fifth grade teacher. Somebody obviously knows where that is. And um, <laughs> she was a she was a high school volleyball and cheerleading coach, and then she went to Dayton, Ohio, where she was also a third and fifth grade teacher and a student support manager. Um, and then she went to Cherry Creek, came to Colorado, beautiful Colorado, as a fifth grade teacher. And then after one year, she said, I'm going to D20. And she came down to D20 and worked at Antelope Trails as a fifth grade teacher, uh, worked at Woodman Roberts as an assistant principal and academic support, Antelope Trails in Mountain View also as assistant principal, and then, then also, if you know, I'm probably going to create some PTSD here. COVID administrator, so you all remember that. So she really helped out a lot because there's a lot of communication we had to do during that time frame. And uh, she currently serves as an internet, international Kagan trainer and coach. We're pleased to recommend Keisha to you tonight for the position of Homeschool Academy principal. Keisha, anything you'd like to say? She's never at a loss for words, I'll tell you that. Mom and dad. <laughs> Superhero. Um, good evening, everybody. 
Thank you so much. Those of you who have come specifically for me, and I know there are people who have come specifically for me. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the board. We had a really great lunch today, and I enjoy getting to talk to you all um, and get to know you a little bit better. Ginger, thank you so much for the interview process. JoLynn, you were exceptionally helpful on the front end of things. Um, really quick, my comments just, I really want to make sure that everybody understands how seriously I take this role and this position. I love kids. I love teachers and I love families. I'm a people person. I am approachable and I welcome constructive feedback, positive praise and relationship building. And so that's what I intend to bring to the Homeschool Academy is um, that sense of familial opportunity for us to be able to relate to each other, get to know each other, um, whether that's through some team building and bonding and we're doing some things after school, whether it's during the school day, um, that's my passion. And so um, I won't hesitate to say that I am not sad that we don't do standardized testing at the Homeschool Academy. But I wanna thank you for this time. I'm sorry, Jolynn. I wanna thank you for this time. I look forward to meeting and working with you. Um, families, I am excited to develop relationships with you. I want to learn all of your children's names and I know that's gonna take me some time, but that is one of my biggest goals because I will be on the floor, I will be in the classrooms, I will get my hands dirty. And as Maya Angelou says, if you know who Maya Angelou is, she says, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. So I want to thank District 20 for giving me an opportunity to show who I am so you can believe me. Thank you so much. You know, I'm really hoping she comes out of her shell later once she gets into the position a little bit. Um, all right, my next individual I'd like to introduce tonight is Crystal Rasmussen, who is being recommended as the Executive Director for Learning Services High School. Uh, Crystal holds a Bachelor's of Arts in English from the University of Illinois and a Master's of Science in Education from Northern Illinois University. She is pursuing a doctorate of leadership with a focus on curriculum and instruction. I want you to know I'm also known as Dr. Smart. It's honorary, but you know, just wanted you to know. Um, educational career. Uh, Crystal began her career in Rockford, Illinois as a Health and Science Academy principal then moved to Plano, Illinois, um, and was an assistant principal of curriculum and student services, and then Joliet, Illinois, as a principal, and then came to Colorado and worked in Lewis Palmer District as a uh, director for student services, and currently serves as director for curriculum and instruction in Pueblo uh, School District 60. We are pleased, uh, please, can't even talk. I was gonna say proud and pleased at the same time, and it came out weird. Uh, we are pleased to recommend Crystal uh, to you tonight for the position of Executive Director for Learning Services High School. Crystal, anything you'd like to say? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just seeing the spotlights today and all of the amazing things students are doing um, just makes me super excited to start the journey and um, just really see how I can collaborate and see just not only the great things that are happening already, um, but how we can continue to build on that. Um, and so I just really look forward. I feel very blessed, very fortunate. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you. When Superintendent Haber is done with her update, then we will take one more break and get to shake hands with our new administrators. OK, board, we have had a wonderful uh, couple of weeks, so we have a lot to celebrate. Great happens here in D20. So each year, as you know, D20 honors uh, those individuals who've dedicated 25 more or more years of their career in Academy 20. This year, we celebrated 28 staff that had 25 or more years in our district. And I had a chance to uh, take a picture with uh, Sarah Peterson, who's an AP at uh, Discovery Canyon Elementary. And um, the full list of all of the folks who were, be, who were honored that night are, are found on our ASD website. So really huge congratulations to them. And for their dedication, we really, uh, our success really rests on our people, and I'm just so thankful. And it was so fun to honor those folks. Uh, then we had our district art show, uh, nearly 400 pieces in total uh, since the inception. Art show in 1994 is when it started. 
$115,000 have been awarded directly to D20 students. Uh, and this year featured 50 awards for over $3,000 total. And a huge thank you to Ting. Uh, that company sponsored a majority of the art show as well as uh, Air Academy Credit Union. Um, and a thank you to Amy. We had a great time handing out awards to uh, our wonderful students and pictured is Noah Brecher from Woodman Roberts Elementary School and uh, Danny Ekman from Discovery Canyon Elementary School. But it was a wonderful time uh, to just celebrate our students and their amazing creativity. Uh, we uh, have been working on portrait of a graduate and um, we this time we had students there and uh, Will Parsons, I think that's a good shot of you right there in the um, portrait of a graduate. We really appreciate uh, everybody, but especially having our students there and you had a chance to see our final product. And uh, so just really want to thank everybody who's been a part of that. Uh, we're so close to being able to have that portrait of a graduate, which will be uh, a connection between our board ends and our strategic plan. We had a chance to honor Dr. Smith uh, at um, a reception that we had for him. And I know we just appreciate the many years that he uh, and his service to our students. And personally, I've just really enjoyed uh, getting to work with him. I also want to thank Bree Martin, who is also here because when we went to Pine Creek, and I'm going to ask their students to share here and uh, when we get to our student uh, field trip that we did, but she said we have to go to uh, Miss Davis's class. We just have to. So we went there and um, then I learned all about uh, Tiffany Davis. She's amazing. Uh, she's a graphic arts teacher. She received a letter of congressional recognition for the outstanding leadership, art direction, support, and guidance that she has provided um, in the 5th District of Colorado. And pieces of numerous artists have been placed in a variety of different art competitions over the years uh, and uh, way from when she first started, which was in 2004 at Pine Creek. So just a huge celebration out to her, and I'd love to bring her in for a board meeting to talk more about it. But thank you so much, Bree, uh, for letting us know about her. And we had a chance to visit her classroom, and some of the graphic art uh, projects in there were just phenomenal. And just a, a celebration, a school in the woods. I know uh, <laughs> our principal is here from there and they just had a great time and uh, we were appreciate our local media came out and covered that to see the solar eclipse. So thank you, uh, Patrick, for sharing that picture. It's uh, awesome. I also had a chance to go to school in the woods and they were working on their end projects. And um, Patrick, do you want to, would you mind just kind of coming up real quick and just on the spot because I'm not I am not I will not do its service because it was so you these end of uh, spring projects were amazing. Yeah, the, talk about that. these are our spring field projects and the students are taking one week at a time to dive deep into a science. So we've got students who are the four rotations. There's dendrology, the study of uh, trees. We've got fire ecology um ornithology the study of birds and then pond studies so the students are out doing these hands-on projects and then having to what you're seeing in the pictures there put it all together into a final project so thank you so hold the train miss davis you are here come on up to the mic if you would please um i did not see you back there Thank you so much for your service. It was so fun to get to know you and the amazing projects and just your service with our students. I'd love for you to just talk about your journey here in D20 and some of the awards that you've won. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, so I have been teaching uh, graphic arts at Pine Creek for the past 20 years. This is my 28th year of teaching graphic arts. Um, at Pine Creek, um, students can take computer graphic design, um, commercial art, computer art, and digital photography. Um, they learn how to use Adobe Photoshop, Corel Painter, and um, Adobe Illustrator. They can also earn um, industry-recognized certification in both Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator. And in the past 20 years that I've been at Pine Creek, I have uh, certified over 600 students. That's they amazing. can earn mm -hmm. college credit for that. And um, um, yeah, it's an absolutely wonderful program, and I 
love to have any of you come by and I'd love to share. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And Ms. David, when we're during our break, I'd love for you to come up because we want to get a picture with okay. you to honor you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, and uh, Antelope Trails, I wasn't here for this uh, event, but I have asked principals when they have fun things that are going on to let me know. And this, uh, Laura shared this with me. It was a photo from their spring dance and basketball raffle. Uh, she has been doing some really great uh, activities to bring the community together. The theme was Boots, Scoot, and Boogie. And they had a DJ and did the chicken dance and hokey pokey. Uh, and it was just a wonderful celebration uh, with uh, her students and her families. And you can see they are definitely having a good time. Uh, Eagle View Middle School, uh, Lauren and I had a chance to do a visit there. Uh, and uh, we were just fascinated with the STEM projects. And we're standing by this little case in the back. And uh, it, it's actually a study that's being done by NASA in the classroom. And there were little pods of things in there. Do you remember what they were? Tell me, because I don't. Well, I got very excited. I thought they were brownie bites, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, this must be fruit flies or something like that." That was not brownie bites. They were little, um, like a substrate soil pods ish, right? And they were planting different things and trying different mediums. It's really fun. And giving that research back to NASA, which I thought we thought was really cool. Um, Adrian Murray's had to send me this. She goes, this will be make for a fun super update picture. Uh, they got slimed uh, by uh, students because they reached their fundraiser of $15,000 uh, that their uh, students and families came together. Uh, so it was yogurt and anything that was kind of slimy. And she said it took a while to <laughs> um, get all of that off, but definitely worth it. She said they might do like let the students make them be nachos next year. It might be a little less messy. We'll see. Um, Homeschool Academy, we were able to celebrate them. Uh, just some, uh, they had just done a performance and this middle picture, their reward is they got to do a swap uh, kind of contest. So the students all brought things that they'd want to swap with somebody else, which I thought was really, was really fun. There were earrings and stuffed animals and clothes and the students were just having a really great time. Um, Pioneer Elementary, we had a chance to go there. And in the left, there was a music classroom and they were um, learning how to be bunny rabbits because that was what they were gonna do for their spring um, session. And then Village Middle School. And of course, Ash is here, so I'm asking her to come up um, because it's so cool that they were doing, would you just mind sharing about this cooking project? So I had a chance to kind of go there during specials. And the student in the upper right-hand corner uh, was given a design challenge. If you want to just talk briefly about those two, because I want you would do it justice, because it's amazing. Yeah. So first of all, I was here for Keisha, but <laughs> I know I take advantage uh, of my resources. Keisha, this is your fault now. Um, okay. So my sweet friend up in the top right corner, um, kind of thinking about what Kyle Chamberlain shared earlier. This kiddo has a, a lot of things that make learning hard, but Oh, so, oh my goodness. So the day before that this picture was taken, he'd been given a roll of duct tape and it was basically design engineering challenge started with like just that. And what are you going to create? And in his time, he created this little pouch um, that you could open or close to put first aid kit items in. And he gifted it to his favorite teacher because she'd recently bought a new car and he felt like she needed this for her car. Um, he also has started our weekly wilderness newsletter, but has turned monthly because uh, he can't keep up. Um, but he's like, but everybody likes the name because, you know, weekly wilderness. Um, and so the next day he came back with, you can't tell, but it is a tri-fold duct tape first aid kit that he had put magnets into. He went home and did this on his own time that same night that he'd been given this roll of duct tape and had his first, you know, iteration of it. And then told Ms. Beer, I just didn't feel like that was enough for you to have in your car. And it had pockets, um, magnets so that it would close. And he had outfitted it with all of the items you would need, like a multi-tool gauze. Um, I told him I would buy one and he should start selling them for our cars. And this is a kid that learning is hard. Um, and 
he writes a newsletter. <laughs> um, he comes back with this that he did on his own time for a teacher that he's created this relationship with. And it was the cutest thing so cute. ever. Um, I want one. Uh, and then I would love all of you to think about cooking with 30 to 40 middle schoolers. And just like, what, like, does that make you feel like excited, panicked, nervous? Um, Miss Beer and Mr. Hillborn, like that is their, their jam and their zone. Um, and we have led these explore classes that students get to design and pick. And, you know, they were like, can we have more microwaves? And yes, we cook ramen without water sometimes and it smells terrible. But I'm like, if we don't teach them how to do this, we've bought knives and we're teaching them how to use them. I mean, it's terrifying, but I'm like, but who, somebody has to teach them how to do this. And so this is Miss Beer. All the students, they worked in groups and had to create their own cookie recipe. And her and Alex led 35 middle schoolers through baking cookies. Um, some were really good. I was like, I'd pay $5 for that cookie. Some, I was like, I probably, I would not like that cookie, but what did you learn? Um, <laughs> we, we just, it's just been really fascinating to see that has become a really natural space for problem solving and character building and all the things that when I was a classroom teacher, I was like, when am I going to teach character ed? When am I going to teach communication, right? Like, how do I fit that? And I'm like, no, it, it, it happens here. I showed Ginger like the vision for a kitchen that we want to build in our space so that our kids don't have to go from one room for the oven to another room for the dishwasher to another room. Um, and it was just our kids loved being able to share with you and really appreciated fun. you coming. Thank you so much. Back to Keisha. <laughs> so had a we had a chance to be at Legacy Peak and uh, that was really awesome. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Derek and Amy for uh, going there with me. Um, and uh, we were at Rack Rimmen, uh, Lauren and I, and it was the recorder concert, the best recorder concert I have ever seen. Uh, and uh, they actually uh, came and did a surround sound and they sang Rocky Mountain High from John Denver. So I got a little choked up at that one. Um, and then uh, you sent this to me from Foothills, Lauren did, they were doing the very, Hungry Caterpillar and Lauren. I love this picture. I'm going to print it out and just put it probably right here. Um, Ms. Tannehill is here in the flesh right there. Um, got to be in her classroom today for this event. Um, it is so special. It was so fun. I had no idea that I was actually going to be eating food prepared by children. I'm okay. Um, I kind of have some hard rules about them <laughs> that I broke today because I didn't want to break their little hearts. Um, I'm going to say if you ever go to this um, event, you're going to want to order your um, little sandwich like easy on the sun butter because uh, kindergartners, they just, they like, they go for the gold there. They, um, they're all in. Um, this event was really special and I could tell your kids felt so proud of themselves and um, lots of learning happening, right? And lots of interaction with grown-ups and taking orders and service and um, Ash, to your point of what am I going to teach all those things? Here's another example in another place in this amazing and beautiful district with beautiful people in it, um, teaching these kids far beyond just, just our content, right? Um, life skills. Is there, is there, I'm not really probably supposed to invite anyone up. <laughs> We're in the vein of doing that. No, you're good. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for letting me be there. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Had a chance to go to the warehouse, which was great. Uh, got to meet Patrick, uh, Mustafel, Troy, Stival, and Heather Walker. I was fascinated with the Science Center, uh, my, my science background. What they do to put together science kits for our elementary teachers is phenomenal. Like I was like, where were you when I was a science teacher? It used to take me hours to put stuff together for labs, and they just organize it. They have it all ready to go. And the whole warehouse, I'm just really impressed with how well organized and how clean it was. And uh, Patrick's just so enthusiastic about the warehouse and was showing me some of the other changes that they want to do. So we'll have to take a, a field trip out there sometime together because it really is uh, great to see. And now our student uh, advisory council, we um, and two of our students are here to speak uh, just to talk about our trip. Um, and you guys want to talk about your trip first and then I'll just go through the slides. Okay, hi, both 
Will and I. We are on the SSAC, which is the um, Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Thank you very much. I forgot that one word. Um, so we had gone to the meeting in the winter, which was all the schools in Colorado, right? Yeah, and a lot of the schools had talked about in their district, they went and saw all the schools in their district, and we were like, oh, because, like, unless you play a sport or you do something where you would intentionally go to another school within the district, you don't really know what that looks like. So everyone was kind of on the idea, and Superintendent Miss Harbury was like, okay, that's actually a good idea. So we got permission slips, and we were like, what are the schools that we want to see the most? Because each school in District 20 kind of has a different niche about them. So um, something a little bit unique. So we, the three schools we decided on was DCC, Pine Creek, and The Village. So you can talk down. <laughs> yeah, it was just, uh, it was a great experience uh, visiting the mall. It really gave you a new perspective of everything. And like how, like when you give ideas, it's mostly just for like our school. But like now visiting all the other schools, it's like nice to tell like what can help not just our school, but all the schools. And going to like DCC, which is a massive campus, like multiple schools combined versus the village, which used to be a bank. It's like really crazy just seeing like <laughs> how like different schools kind of like go along with each other and like what we can do just not to just improve our school, but to improve all of them. Do you want to talk about what you guys thought of the biomedical? Uh... That thing was crazy. Okay, so I'm sorry. If you guys have not been to DCC, there is this board in the bio room and it's basically like a super duper big computer. And what they do is they actually take real... Um, what are they called? I don't want to say bodies. Cadavers. That sounds so bad, you guys. Cadavers. So, and they change their face um, for privacy reasons. But what you can do is you can actually make incisions on a real body for this biomedical program. And you get to, like, blow up all the way down to, like, the nervous system, the bones, the skin. Like, you can see just about everything within the body in incisions you want to make. And then it also names everything. So you don't have to, like, pull out your encyclopedia and find the femur. You can just tap on the screen and, like, zoom in and you see each detail and then it also has like a piece of the heart and you can watch which way it moves to the beat of like the um it's cool. the thing the where it's like beep beep EKG. <laughs> yeah, i'm yeah. sorry guys i'm so sorry but um and then you basically can figure out like these different way the heart moves and why it makes a sound to that machine and it was like visually crazy because you get that visual connection to what's going on with the body rather than the explanation of like so this is what it might look like but actually seeing the visual connection and what's going on in the body with that huge amount of detail was like mind-blowing so sorry I didn't mean to take that <laughs> very, very detailed that was <laughs> I had to watch Will there for a while. I wasn't sure if he was going to go down, but you did good. You just <laughs> stood through the whole thing. It was awesome. And I know they're in the process of getting a mobile one, too. They want to write another grant so that they can. This one doesn't has to stay in the room, but they want to be able to move it around. Um, we had a chance uh, to see the um, what the CTE. There was a, a, a cafe there at one of the schools on engineering projects um, and um, there we are in front of Pine Creek. And of course, we had to go to the pool. And a thank you, um, Ms. Davis, for showing us around your classroom. You can see some of the beautiful uh, artwork there in the background. Um, and it really is a beautiful pool. So again, thank you to all of our taxpayers for uh, approving that bond because it is just truly amazing. Uh, and then the village was awesome. Uh, just a real different uh, format there. And uh, what did you guys think of the village since that was kind of really different from the schools that you guys go to? I thought it was really interesting seeing how like they're only in classroom about half the time and a lot of the other stuff is like online, do it at your own pace. And the fact that it used to be a bank, I thought that was very fascinating. And it's like how small it is and how they get mentors to like each teacher. And I thought like the entire like process of like how they go to school is very, very different than anything else I've ever seen. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? I was going to say the most interesting thing that one of, I think it was the principal there, had said was um, we treat school like it's real life work. 
Okay, so if you miss a day or you're doing other things within your life, you still have to do the work. You still have to, you know, show up if you didn't send that email, you know. So it's kind of like real life doesn't stop just because you're doing other things. And it was kind of like a real life multitasking tool that I think a lot of a lot of kids could use, especially when they're going to college. And we got to see the vault. You guys, it's a mini classroom inside this huge door. Like they can't take the vault door off unless they like explode it. So like we still have the vault door right here. And it was it was just like a mini classroom. It was really cool, really innovative. Everyone kind of had like their own individual work time. It was really interesting. So, so um, and there we are at the village. We got to see some of the different um, and uh, different kind of classrooms. It was really awesome. Um, I just want to I just want to thank you guys for being here tonight. It's so great to have student voice and hear your perspective. So let's give these guys a hand. All right, so um, just to finish up real quick, uh, Project Search, we know we've got a graduation coming up there. And let me get, uh, this is uh, Guadam Nadaran. Uh, we're excited that uh, he was the first Project Search intern to obtain a competitive employment. They have to apply. And starting next week, Guatam will be working full-time as a cook for Sodexo at UC Health Memorial Hospital North. And this aligns well with Guatam's talents as he has previous culinary experience, spent one of his internships working uh, in the kitchen at Memorial Hospital Central. Uh, so we just really appreciate the opportunities that Project Search gives to our students. And just real quick, we wrapped up our stakeholder um, meetings, all the different groups, and just wanted to give you an overview and some data around our, uh, our groups. Uh, and just we really worked hard to increase the number of stakeholders that we uh, want to interact with and, and get their feedback from. And so you can see there was last year it was approximately 227. This year we had approximately 347. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, here's all the different topics that we uh, covered. Uh, and each time, uh, especially October through the rest of the year, there was some type of feedback that we wanted to get uh, from these different groups. So you can see um, the uh, resource allocation committee, committee kind of and around the strategic plan. They gave all of those stakeholder groups, gave us some great feedback on that portrait of a graduate. And each time we came back later and shared, here was what the feedback was in general from the stakeholder groups. And here's what, you know, we, we took action on. Um, in January, school finance, and for each one of these topics, uh, we had great discussions. So the person would present, and then people had a chance to ask questions, and we had some really good uh, dialogue. And even by the types of questions people are asking about those topics, we just really learned a lot about, you know, what uh, what are people keen in on, and what do we need to continue to really uh, be intentional about communicating. Uh, and we tried um, just having people submit questions virtually. Uh, and then uh, Mary and I would go through all of them and just pick out themes and uh, share out, you know, uh, responses to themes. But the feedback that we continually got as well, actually, we want to see what questions were submitted and, and can you just answer those ones specifically, but we want to see what the questions are. So we did that uh, in our last meeting. Uh, we printed the uh, questions so that everyone could see from the different stakeholder groups. Uh, and then we were able to give responses to those questions. And then we left time also uh, for people to ask questions at the end. And so we'll we'll follow a format similar to that uh, next year. Um, and we're still looking, uh, I think next year we'll really use those groups to focus on the specific parts of the strategic plan, as well as uh, the follow-up that'll be needed with the portrait. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, just a few pictures. One of we had a great one on artificial intelligence. Lori Hartman did a good job with that. Um, I was so excited to show ChatGPT to this uh, gentleman patron because uh, he hadn't seen it before, and, and so uh, it was fun just to explore with others. This is just a group, a leadership group, a women's leadership group that I've been invited to, and um, just making great connections. Uh, Lindsay Pack and and Caesar are there, and they've just been great partners with. Uh, with us here in D20 and actually Lindsay reached out to me in an email recently and really wanted me to go on the field trip because she and Ann are going to Cherry Creek School District to see their innovation center on the 23rd. So I changed my schedule and I'm going to go with them and see what we learn and I'll come back and share about that. So 
I know it was a little lengthy, but that was uh, my update and just so thankful to be here in D20 and we great really does happen here every day and it's just fun to be in classrooms and be a part of that. Thank you so much. Um, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda as posted. Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mrs. Shandy. Aye. Mr. Wilburn. Aye. Mrs. Jenez. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. And I just want to give a real quick uh, statement about 7 p on our agenda. As discussed, we want to be efficient and intentional with district, school, and board time next year. The Board of Education is moving our meetings to be held once per month with additional meetings as needed and appropriate. We look forward to freeing up staff time to focus more on our student achievement and academic outcomes. Mrs. Matson bonet um, how many are on the live? 33. 33, thank you. And we will gladly take one more quick break to welcome our new administrators.
All right, boardroom, we are resuming our meeting. Items pulled from the consent agenda. There are none. Um, our first written report tonight, D20 transportation ridership software planning. Does any member of the board have any questions or comments? One second, Mrs. Shandy's pulling hers up. Mrs. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Uh, let's see here. Uh, why not student ridership too? Was the cost too great? And just in comparison with some of the other districts who had done both, and we were we had just done um, one aspect of it. So I was just curious. So is the question about the cost of the the ridership? Yeah. So some districts did co two components of it, and we had just done one component. Right. Um, and so I was just wondering why not, why didn't we do both? So um, as I understand, the district tried to do the second piece that we're talking about now, the student ridership, in addition to the turn by turn navigation about 10 or 11 years ago. And that was a failed attempt, as I understand. I wasn't here then. I don't know exactly what was wrong. However, we're 12 years farther into the software and the technology. And we were working on this project about five or six years ago. Then COVID hit and the project got put on the back burner and we have um, re-energized the project. And I meant uh, you, you just like jumped in for a chance. So this is Joey Eisenhut, our director of transportation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then I was just going to say, uh, just an idea, um, Chio, would be great to, a great time to maybe talk about the possibility of partnering with the USAFA Capstone Projects, where it's a community project and and they get experience evaluating, you know, logistics and things like that, then they have to come present or, or whatnot. So just an idea that could be a really great partnership between us and the Air Force Academy as we continue doing that with other things as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Hi, sorry, Mrs. Chair. <laughs> Mrs. Yunus. Um, I noticed as I was prepping that um, this ridership software will, um, there will be a savings in printing, right? So the rosters and the So, So the maps? printing savings. Routes. Yeah, the printing savings will be negligible. We'll still need to provide a folder on the bus for each one of the drivers that will have the, the route navigation, if you remember MapQuest back in the day, we have printed directions. We'll also keep the, um, uh, the student rosters with pictures in a folder on the bus. Those will be backups just in case something happens with the software, a tablet breaks, or we lose cell coverage for a certain time. We'll still have that backup. So the, the printing savings negligible. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Wilburn. I can see the um, the lost cards expense becoming its own light item, line item real quick. Um, so I I don't think you have the lost card fee beginning after the first card is lost. So they get one freebie, and it, is it is it charged the student or the family two dollars, but the card cost us a dollar ninety nine. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So now, we're essentially making a penny. There's really no. It's it's a uh, it's at cost. Okay. Well, even that first loss one could add up. It it could. We uh we went up to Cherry Creek, who has who uses the same uh, software system that we're talking about, the Tyler Tech solution, and uh, they don't charge for lost cards first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and um, that's just an absorbed cost that they that they take into account. I we still haven't really determine how we want to handle lost cards, except that the first one will absorb. We'll work that in the budget and, and we'll provide the first one. We'll provide the first lost one. And then we're still in discussions at, at the operations level on how we want to handle subsequent cards. OK. I mean, I have a kid that lost two jackets, three hats, four notebooks and a Every car. while I have anxiety and <laughs> I lose this. OK, thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions? OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. Um, Career Academies and Portrait of a Graduate Report. Does anyone have questions or comments? 
Mrs. Yanez. Mrs. Chair, I didn't even have to say it. You saw my <laughs> face. Um, Dr. Pariso, would you like to come to the podium? Um, our work session on this was so exciting and helpful. And um, I think we had started to kind of talk about the elementary piece, how we're building this up throughout. It's not just like this gets dropped in at sixth grade with ICAP, that this is something that unites our or connects our site plan um, and the port portrait of the graduate site plan and our board ends. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that elementary piece? I'm just excited about it. and. Um, also it's secondary, but it feels like it's um, not a better fit, but just a more natural fit, right? At yeah. the secondary to have some of these conversations. Yeah, so the Porch River Graduate is alignment, like we talked about earlier, with um, the post-secondary workforce readiness standards or essential skills standards of the state. And so that needs to be implemented really K-12, right? And so this really gives us a means to do that. Um, ICAP is a huge component of that for secondary, but obviously for elementary, the Porch River Graduate is relevant there. And so as we go into next year and we start developing um, how we measure it and all the different facets of it, then we'll be definitely addressing the different grade clusters or different grade levels. So like what, you know, leadership or, or some of the different terms that we have in there looks like for first, second, third grader. Obviously, the expectation would be different there than it would for 11th or 12th grade student. So that's something that'll be built into it in the work that will happen in the fall. Thank you. The other thing that I wanted to just tack on to that was the, um, this isn't something else, right? This isn't like an additional layer. So like for schools that have IB learners and uh, attitudes and learner profiles, I think I got that right. Um, one of them went away, but I can't remember which one. Uh, this, they're doing the work of those things that are being called out in those essential skills and through this, uh, the competency. So this is, it's really just across the board holding hands and really casting a vision for what our graduates It's It's be. a way to connect it all. And so there's not silos going on, but it's a way to connect it and have like an, an overarching district um, vision and purpose for that. And then as the work continues, as sites you utilize the resources and materials that get developed for that, then they could connect it to what they're already doing and also look for maybe deficits or holes or ways to shore up or improve. So it's not something that's another additional layer of something separate, it all interconnects. Sorry, I have one more question. So yeah, capturing this data is always the, the hard part, right? So are we looking at, um, has there been conversation around um, student portfolios and ways to, okay, that's, I'm really excited about that piece. Yeah, so as it gets developed and created, then those types of things would be ways that we would show evidence that those things are accomplished or, or happening. And then in my world, particularly in the secondary aspect of things, it integrates really well in a lot of our vision around career academies, CT programming, work-based learning, um, all sorts of different project-based aspects of it as students take what they learn academically and apply it in relevant ways to potential jobs and careers and, and post-education opportunities. And, and because Schoology is something that even our students at um, elementary level are using, is it possible that they could be building portfolios in that same place? Mm -hmm. I mean, theoretically, can K-12? Yeah, definitely. And then our new college and career platform that we're moving to next year has um, that will be integrated in with ICAP as we look to update that structure. So it's more than just checkboxes. But that also goes down to the elementary, even the kindergarten level where there's activities and curriculum that are geared toward elementary. And that's new because our previous platform didn't have that, uh, didn't have that function. It also didn't have a work-based learning um, component. Uh, this new one does. And so, in fact, our work-based learning coordinator is working with them to actually build it out and develop it even further. They're really interested in really expanding that opportunity. So when it comes to having databases of industry partnerships and work-based learning opportunities and documenting it and collecting that data, um, it's all part of that. So it's pretty pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Chair, go ahead. Uh, for just for full inc inclusion, where is the special education population represented in the portrait and how do we um, anticipate pulling that out for them? Yeah, so as we, Kind of mentioned or talked about um, also earlier today it's something that this is for all students and so as we develop and get down to the kind of the weeds 
in the sense of how that's realized. Those are all people that will be at the table in the sense of how we can make sure that all students are included in it. Any skill set that we're talking about developing, no matter what any kind of physical or mental limitations you have, you could develop and improve those skills. So this is something that is not like, you know, students will learn calculus, advanced calculus at a high level. This is this is interpersonal skills. This is leadership skills. This is being able to communicate and do different things that our industry partners are begging that high school students graduate with with that. And the best way to develop it is to practice it. The best way to practice it is to integrate it into curriculum into what we do as a district. And so that's why a portrait of a graduate is so important is because it gives us a purpose to integrate that in more effectively. So we're not just solely focused on academics, which is important, but then we're applying that academics in meaningful ways that will really help them and give them an edge when they enter the workforce or enter post-secondary opportunities. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or questions? Uh, Dr. Pierce, so I just a um, couple quick things. I want to reiterate what I said in the study session that this um, the Colorado essential skills standards that we keep that literally up on the screen as we continue to finish this portrait of a graduate work so that we can be making sure we are capturing all these skills because it's such a complete wonderful list. Our portrait of a graduate has most of it, but I would love to see us working off these essential skills just as we fine tune it and and grow it out. And then secondly, about career academies, I just want to say how exciting it is to me. Specifically, I just want to read from your slideshow here. Um, studies have followed students through high school comparing a career academy students with similar students at the same schools. Academy students show significant improvement in attendance, grades, credits earned, and are more likely to stay engaged in high school. And I mean, I think that is what our teens are clamoring for anyway. It's what we need to deliver for them is to give them a place to be fully invested and excited again. And so I'm just thrilled that we're giving them more opportunities. So well, thanks. I'm happy you're excited about it. I know Superintendent Haber um, has had experience with career academies elsewhere, just like I have elsewhere, and I've seen it be transformational not just for the school site, but for the kids involved. And some of the most amazing experiences I have as an educator is seeing kids go through that system and seeing industry partners totally jazzed and excited about it and actually end up really helping kids even through post-secondary opportunities and end up hiring these students. And, they, and it really creates a full circle because a lot of industry partners just don't know how to fully integrate in and this really gives an avenue for that as we really look to embed the work-based learning through the continuum of that career academy. Um, and also our other CT programming that exists too. So that's something that I'm very passionate about. I've seen it and I want, really want D20 students to be able to experience that. Just to echo, I have a teacher friend who, um, his child, I'm trying to be as confidential as possible, whose child reverted, went to a CTE program this year instead of sticking with the traditional model. And yes, just to you know, echo what you said. She said it turned his life around. Well, and, and just to be yeah. clear too, like what a lot of people, a big misunderstanding about career technical education is an old version of it where it's just the three shops, auto, wood, and metal. And with the career cluster model that, that has popped up in the last 20 years, there's potentially a CT program for any industry sector. And so, for example, my oldest son, you know, he was in an engineering CT program, did an internship with an engineering outfit here in town and got into an engineering program of his choice because it, it gave him that connection, gave him a resume builder. And it was just a, an amazing experience for him and really helped him focus in on what type of engineer he wanted to be because uh, there's a wide variety. And um, all the engineers I talk to say, don't do mechanical because there's too many. Do electrical because that's where the guaranteed money is. So luckily that's what he's doing. So he could take care of me when I'm old. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all your time today and thank you over the years on this. Thank you. Salary and benefits information, potential changes to EL 2.7. Does anyone have comments or questions? And um, Board Chair, I would like to, uh, I know that I felt like we were a little rushed kind of at the end. So if possible, I'd love for um, Ms. Allen, Mr. Um, smart to come up and and uh, if uh, Ms. Allen could just show that one slide that had all that information on it. I know I'd, I'd still like to take another look at it to digest all of it and 
uh, just hit some of the main points um, that we um, talked about, but we didn't really have a chance to ask as many questions as I think we could have because we were near the end of our time. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, so what you see in front of you is really a summary of the salary and benefit proposal that I will be sharing with you on May 9th as part of the proposed budget presentation for 24-25. Now, it's important to note I've got it in pink on the lower, the right. So I anticipate unless something drastically were to change to the School Finance Act formula for next year. Now, it's important to note when I'm referring to the School Finance Act formula, it is for next year, 24-25. There is a separate formula, some changes to the formula that are a different bill that I know that Ms. Thompson will be sharing information about a little bit later tonight. So when we think about the increase in our per pupil revenue from our current mid-year budget this year to next year, it's about a 6.98% increase. That equates to about $13.3 million. That is after we collect that additional revenue and give the money that is also due to the charters. So we net about $13.3 million. Now, as we think about our salaries and benefits, it is truly our top priority. It is where we start first with our planning and we figure out how much can we afford. It's that simple. It's no different than you do in your own household when you think about how you are allocating the funds that come in. One of the big measures that we look at to help guide where we're starting with, obviously, how much new revenue are we getting? And what is the inflationary rate? It is our goal to at least meet or exceed the inflationary rate so that our staff feel like they are at least keeping up with that pace. And, and otherwise, I'm afraid they could think they're they're working for less money when you've got that inflationary factor. So what you can see in the upper right portion of the screen is that the CPI um, or the inflationary rate that we are using, that CDE is using also to add to our base funding amount is 5.2%. So what we are going to propose to you again on May 9th is a 6% recurring raise for all of our four categories of staff. And that's our classified staff, our teachers, our um, specialized service providers, uh, our staff specialists, and our administrators. So that would be 6% all the way along. Now, what would that do to our teacher base? Our base salary right now, that means for a teacher who's coming in with a bachelor's degree only and no additional plus 16, plus 32, none of that on the salary scale, that would be uh, changing from 48,800 to 51,250. It's about a 5% increase to our base. You'd say, Becky, well, why are you doing that when 6% is the other salary? We always need to ensure there's some separation so that a new staff member doesn't come in as a first year teacher, now making the same as a first year teacher who just became a second year teacher. That would not be adequate. Now, you also might be thinking when you look at this chart, you just said that we're just about at 7% increase in the PPR. Why wouldn't you not do 7% down the line? Certainly, we would like to be as high as we can, but the reality is that just because we get that percentage increase in our funding, it does not mean that we can pass that straight on in the form of salaries and benefits because we have other commitments to pay for as well. For next year, here are some of those examples. Um, first of all, we have a $250,000 increase in our workers' compensation, about a $250,000 increase in our property insurance, as probably many of us who are homeowners in this room have experienced with our own property insurance. Those are not exciting expenditures, but that's $500,000. We also had a title cut. That means our title dollars based on our poverty rate it's good that our poverty rate went down, but several years ago, 
When we had that fall, so do the Title I dollars. It was about a $600,000 decrease. At the time, we were just starting with ESSER, so we were able to fill that gap for interventionists, for other teaching staff at our title schools. Um, also, with respect to our literacy tutoring at our elementary schools, ESSER is going away. It is done in September. We can't just stop those interventionists. We can't just stop those literacy tutoring opportunities for our students. That right there is about a million dollars. Coupled with the not so exciting workers' compensation and insurance, there's 1.5 million right there on other things. So let's see what this shakes out to be. When you look at the screen up there, you see the salary and benefit portion is just under 12 million at about 11.88. As you look below it, we also, because the teacher base would go up, so would the rates that coaches, theater teachers the, who get for, for uh, you know, leading a play, leading, leading musical events, there are stipends associated with all of that work. It's all based on a percentage of the base. So when the base salary goes up, so does the cost to pay all of those folks. That's about 438,000. Next, you see health insurance. The last two years we have reduced um, by 10% the premiums that our staff members have to pay for their health insurance. Well, this year, our rates with Kaiser are going up 7% for next year. That's $1.2 million. We are absorbing that so our staff members do not feel that crunch. We don't want it to erode the, the progress we've made in the last two years. We also don't want to erode those salaries. If all of a sudden we give 6% and then the health benefits wet way up, it dilutes what we're trying to accomplish for our staff. So we said we're going to absorb that. Dental as well had a $78,000 increase, so we are absorbing that. So when you look in the lower left there, that 13612 that's the cost for what you see on this slide. Remember what I shared, new revenue from the School Finance Act, not other cuts, just School Finance Act is about 13.3. So you can see we're already a little under underwater by 300,000, not to mention just the example of another 1.5 million in those expenses. And there are, of course, others. We're making other cuts and eliminating Loomis, things to make room to be able to hire more security staff, but you can get, I hope, an overall picture. With this whole picture here, plus everything that will be in the proposed budget that I share with you on May 9th, our budget will be upside down. What that means is you have less money going in than going out by about $900,000. Typically, I present one about $2 million upside down. Being more conservative this year because there's some uncertainty around funding in the future that Ms. Thompson will share a little in a little bit. So this is what we have for the update. Again, you will see those pieces as we get to that proposed budget on May 9th. And then I want to turn it over to Mr. Smart. I know one of the big things that he is excited again to bring up with this group um, is how when we look at these different salary amounts, how do we ensure that they're commensurate? How are we keeping up with other school districts? And right now, there's two looks. We have one group, uh, administrators are looked on, upon at one area, and then a different area in the state looking at teachers. So Mr. Smart is going to talk with you about an important recommendation around making those comparison zones or the pool of comparison equal for both of those. So I'll turn to you. She took all my thunder there, but it's, no, just kidding. So. Uh, we re really didn't have time to really discuss this uh, at our study session. So um, again, we would uh, ask for some of you to consider some adjustments to um, the interpretation. So that's what we're talking about interpretation in EL 2.7. Uh, one is using geographical market for all positions uh, rather than splitting it out and having admin in one and um, teachers and classified in a different one. The other thing is we've kind of talked a bit about this. The uh, definition of deviate materially doesn't really doesn't give the same impression as when we talk about um, being in the top quartile. 
Um, and then another definition we'd look at as well. But the other thing is if we go to solely geographical for everyone, we'd like to look to include a few other districts in that geographical market. Um, one we look at, well, what would be a, an average range that somebody might commute for, for some of our positions? So looking to about a 30 to 50 mile uh, range is probably putting us in, in the range of where somebody would commute to, to come and work for us. And that would include, uh, allow us to include Douglas County in that in that geographical region, as well as um, districts in Pueblo going south. Um, so that would be one of the recommendations we would ask you to consider looking at. Um, and then also looking at top quartile. The issue with is we're always looking at this in the rear, right? So we're um, making a prediction now for next year what we hope, you know, our, our uh, race will keep us in that top quartile, but we don't know what other districts are gonna do. So then as we evaluate through the, the cycle, which is from February now till February next year, um, if we're out of compliance in, in one of those areas, a lot of times it's usually, a, like we said, a few positions, maybe classified or a small group, um, then we are then we don't really have time to fix it. You know, So we'd like to have a little bit of time to say, okay, if we do happen to show that based on our pr prediction, because we're not knowing what everyone else is going to do, this would give us opportunity to have a two-year cycle to uh, get back in alignment with being in the top quartile, because as we mentioned also in the in the presentation since we've been using top quartile which we have for over a decade we're almost never in full compliance we usually have a few positions that uh, other districts might change that we don't have an opportunity to fix during that cycle so that would give us an opportunity to to make adjustments within there so mr smart just to clarify what um my understanding is then for right now the geographical area that we use uh, to see how our salaries compare, our, our compensation packages compare geographically for administrators is a different geographical area than teachers. Correct. And that what we want to look at into next year is having the same geographical area per teachers and administrators. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. One's called professional market, which extends up into the Denver Metro area, um, and the other's called geographical, which is really our region that we that we are in. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Any other comments? So, Mr. Smart, you can, sorry. I just want to make sure the board is clear. How would you like our feedback from that last slide? By what date? Yeah, and, uh, and let me kind of, so everybody understands too, yeah. when we're working with the ELs, it's really the board sets the, the parameters, right, of here's the what, and then this, because it, it relates to the superintendent specifically in her evaluation, this, the superintendent says, hey, here's how we're going to accomplish that. So really it'd be you uh, sharing with superintendent, hey, here's what we'd like you okay. to consider. And then having some conversation um, on what can be agreed upon that you feel meets, uh, will help meet that. And also that superintendent feels is uh, something we can actually do. Excellent, okay, we will work with her. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Wilburn. I know I, I backstabbed you. Um, has stipend pay for extracurricular coaching and, and what have, have you, has that always been tied to pay increase on a percent basis or was that once upon a time a flat rate? Yeah, no, it, and it's just recently we uh, changed it to be um, associated with the base increase. It used to be a flat rate and sometimes those stipends were 10 plus years uh, without going up. Actually, when you look at summer school, um, that wasn't initially tied to base increase. And it had been, matter of fact, the same for a very long time. And we just made some changes last year to, to fix that. Um, and so, yeah, it's been only a few years that we've actually tied it to the base. Does it make more sense to keep it tied to base or have a policy whereby we simply review every three, five years or what have you, what the base pay is and is it reasonable? We feel it's it's more reasonable to have it tied to the base. Okay. So it's more commensurate with what we're doing with other with our overall positions. I suspect the dollars come out just about the same either way. Yeah. Loosely. And the other thing is then we maintain our competitiveness in that area as well. Okay. Thank you all. Monthly financial report through March 2024. Does anyone have questions or comments? Mrs. Oh. Shandy? Yeah. And we're talking about the 2024 budget um, finance one, that Cor slide? Correct, Ms. Yeah. Allens. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Hi. OK, uh, quick question. So in the local revenue section, yes. uh, why are we so underfunded? Is it just a timing issue? It sure is. So if you were to look, um, it'd be graph two. It kind of looks like this from the beginning of the year till March. Then the slope, it starts to get heavier. March is when we start to collect our property taxes. And so it's slower until we get to that point. And it's even more accelerated or animated this year because our local share of property taxes went even higher. So that money doesn't come until March. So our state share went lower. That's the money we get in the first part. So it spikes up, so it's pretty typical. And it'll stay on a spike. We'll still get those monies coming in through June. OK. <clears throat> um, for the teachers, non-teachers, professionals, paraprofessionals, yeah. some of those uh, um, class groups, we're, we're very under budgeted for those. I'm assuming it's because we're not fully staffed. The main reason is for teachers and paraprofessionals, their contract year goes from August 1 to July 31st. So what happens is in June, we have the June pay and we accrue what we pay them in July. So it's kind of behind by one month's worth of payment that catches up by the end of June. That's the biggest reason. I will tell you part of that is some unfilled positions as well, but the biggest phenomenon is that we, we don't pay them uh, everything on that same rate as an administrator or staff specialist. It's broken out evenly. It's delayed that month and that accrual happens. OK, um, page three, <clears throat> um, equipment. Yes. Both this year and last year, we exceeded the budget amount for those um, for equipment. Why? You know why? So if you take a look on page three and it's small up there, I was going to. OK, <laughs> um, so a little below the halfway point of the page on the left hand side. Do you see where it says non-salaries? It starts with purchased services, purchased property services, other purchased services, supplies, equipment, other expenses. So those lines represent expenses happening in every department and every school across the district. It is hard for us to pinpoint because these are the discretionary budgets that each of those entities get. We do our best, we take the money and divide it with our best guess in these different areas. But if we, we don't usually get it right. It will be, so the overall is not overspent. It's just sometimes where we put the budget, the schools or, de, or departments will move the money. Maybe they need an extra lawnmower at a school. They move more. They bought the lawnmower last year. We looked at the actuals. We budgeted for a lawnmower. They bought it last year. They don't need it this year. It's, it's that type of just guesswork. And so the budget isn't always perfect, but we make sure it's trued up in our audit, our annual comprehensive financial report, but we take our best guess at the at the budget time. Okay, and so follow up to that, and, and maybe you just kind of already answered it, was in that same category, you have supplies and equipment and then other expenses is over a million dollars. What What is left after supplies and equipment to go into the other? Other expenses would be like dues, fees uh, for certain things field trips go in there. Another big one, all the athletic budgets for our high schools and anything that goes to a middle school goes in that category. Those are the types of dollars that go in there. Okay. Um, the total expenditure contingency, yes. uh, eight, you know, close to eight million. Was that for the Douglas Valley? I, I, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure. It's net. So the eight million is a is a net. About 9.3 million of it is the PSMI. Mm -hmm. We had a decrease in Medicaid. Um, we had a decrease in our staff leave buyback because we use some of those dollars. So if you net it all out, it's about an $8 million increase, but you're right on. The vast majority of it is the projects on the academy. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wilburn. Uh, one of the graphs, maybe number five or something, I can't remember, um, showed that we are pretty well ahead of the three-year rolling average for uh, cash and investments on hand. 
is that just from you being frugal or is that market performing well and, and giving us more interest in the first couple, last couple of years or what? Well, yeah, the- so graph six shows that cash uh, yes, flow. Six. Yep, if you just go, there you go, that's it. So oh. um, the rolling is that blue at the bottom. And part of the reason is we use something called pooled cash. What that means is that different accounts that we have goes into one area. It gives you more cash flow because you have more cash as you're looking at those areas. Um, The other reason that you see that it spikes up in March is the same question that Ms. Shandy asked on her first question about why is the revenue slower? Because you see that spike at that point when we have that influx of revenue. And this is the one we talked a little bit towards the beginning of the year that the cash flow was going to get tighter because our local share was so much larger. So that pool of money is later to us in March. So we were going to be tighter up until we got to March until we normally have been. But because of that pooled cash, that's why over the three year we look stronger. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Third quarter Board of Education discretionary budget update. Does anyone have questions or comments on that? Mr. Chair. Mrs. Shandy. Uh, We have a good picture of our board budget at the end of the school year with the bulk of the purchasing done. Uh, Travel, gifts, retirement banquet have already all been paid for. Uh, So any remaining balance goes back to the unassigned fund and the general fund. So we're sitting in a good position. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that. All right, we are on to item 10, section 10 of our agenda with the presentations. Challenger Learning Center of Colorado, annual update. Superintendent Haber. Yes, could uh, Ron Bush, CEO for the Challenger Learning Center, please come to the podium. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for giving me time to uh, present to you. Um, It's nice to see familiar faces and it's nice to meet uh, the new faces up here. Um, This is always a joy of mine to come and uh, and just share uh, the success that we've had in what is now a 22 year partnership between the Challenger Learning Center uh, and District 20. And so um, I really want to focus on um, what we're providing for District 20 in terms of student programs. Uh, I love that the conversation earlier talked about those essential skills. Uh, Ms. Kahn's, I know you have been by our center. Uh, I came by with your daughter. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we want to inspire students. We want to provide opportunity. So everything that we do in a challenger program uh, focuses on those essential skills. We're putting them through uh, a real world mission. I, I, one of the ways I describe it is it's like ropes course without the physical activity. Um, so they're coming in, they're working, they're problem solving. Um, and so, um, you know, that's what we get to do for D20 students. So this year, uh, Challenger has another rec- record setting year for student programs. We'll run 777 total programs uh, this school year, um, serving about 32,000 students in total. Um, of that, almost 40% are specifically D20 schools and D20 programs. Uh, So that's around 12,650 D20 students getting to experience challenger programs uh, just this year alone. And so um, if you look at the chart that I have on there and that was in the report to the board, uh, we're gonna run 303 programs this year. Uh, And just to kind of point to, um, you know, relative how that that has, has grown over the years, for the first 17 years that the Challenger Learning Center was located in District 20. Uh, We were doing about 60 to 70 missions or programs per year. Uh, When we moved into our new facility in 2019 um, uh, with the goal of of serving not just the middle school students, but students all across uh, the grade levels, uh, we've increased our programs uh, that are available. Um, We've jumped from about 65 in 2018 uh, to 303 this year. So that's an increase of 480% uh, when we look at the the programs that we are providing for students. So this year, um, as part of our agreement with District 20, um, the district provides $70,000 in program funds so that we can reach um, 
elementary schools and schools that aren't our the the uh, the middle schools. So, uh, for example, um, the homeschool academy. I'm so glad that they got to present today. Uh, they are our neighbors, uh, and we run a at least one program with every single homeschool academy student each year. Um, so that seventy thousand dollars in funding uh, is why we're seeing that growth. This year we had such a demand from District 20 schools um, that we actually went. We we provided Challenger provided about. $36,000 in free programming beyond what the district provided because we didn't want to turn away any any District 20 school. Um, so uh, it just speaks to the success of, of this relationship uh, and the number of students that we serve. Um, I also want to point out, uh, I loved hearing from the students from Aspen Valley. Um, no offense to any of the other middle school uh, groups that come, our staff loves the team from Aspen Valley because those kids get uh, uh, the teamwork aspect of it. They come in uh, just ready to go. And so we all, you know, we always talk about the Aspen Valley groups are just so much fun to watch because we get to sit back and watch those kids when it comes to those essential skills really come to life, work together and have a successful mission. Uh, beyond that this year, and this points to the money that's provided by the district, uh, they had such a great experience. We worked with their eighth grade science teacher uh, and in the beginning of May, we're coming over to help them with some uh, rocketry curriculum. So they reached out and said, we want to do rocketry. We don't know what to do. Can you help us? And so we developed some programs for her and one of our educators will go over uh, and work with those students in May as well. So um, just, you know, really great things that we get to do uh, in, in conjunction with, with the district. Um, so talking about highlights from this year, um, one of the things that we've done now for two years is what we call our second Saturday science events. Uh, these are designed to be uh, for families to come in and just get STEM activities and a show in our planetarium uh, the second Saturday of every month. Uh, just kind of a give back to the community. This is a free event that we do. Um, and so uh, this year, we, or just this spring, we started partnering with the Colorado Springs Rocket Society. So now they not only get to come in, do a hands-on STEM activity each month, a show in the planetarium that uh, works through a different science topic, uh, but they will have the opportunity to launch rockets uh, every single month. And so said in the notes there, we, we gave away 70 rockets in our March event. We gave away um, almost 80 uh, at our event, event uh, this past Saturday. Uh, so families just get to go out and, uh, and get to experience that. Um, as a part of that event as well, we um, did an event for the eclipse back in October. We had 2,000 uh, additional solar viewers, which we gave away to District 20 teachers, put a call out to our network of D20 teachers and said, if you want solar viewers, let us know, we'll set them aside. And so we were able to, to support the district in that way as well. Um, I did receive one question in advance from the board. I'll just answer it now because it was about our second Saturday events. And that was how do those get marketed to uh, the public? Uh, we have a number of ways that we do that. We do have our social media channels, um, which we have an intern run because, you know, they are uh, up to speed on a lot of those things that I'm not or our staff isn't. Um, we also have a network of hundreds of teachers that we send out a newsletter to, uh, and we do updates. We have the same thing for a public newsletter. So any uh, person that's attended a public event, a summer camp, or a school program with us gets an email uh, reminder about those. We also work with the teams on our campus. So Legacy Peak Elementary advertises that uh, in their weekly newsletter, the Homeschool Academy and the Village Middle School, since we're all on that same campus. That way we're making sure that anybody that's within that really close region uh, knows about those events. Um, other highlights from this year, we did roll out four or three brand new um, missions this year. We have an upgraded software system, uh, and so all new all students will experience new mission experiences. Some of them we were running this year uh, were 12, 15 years old, and now with the updated software, um, they look exceptional. The science is better. Um, there is more hands-on activities, and so we think it's just a better experience uh, for the students. Um, one of the things that we've been able to grow this year, and I'll kind of highlight the last two bullet points there, um, you know, in that agreement with District 20, um, you all provided additional staff funding for us to hire an educator, uh, a new educator this year. That effort uh, or that that staff member has been working on a dream of ours to uh, advance what we do for high school students, especially when it comes to engineering. 
Um, we are very good at the K through eight programming when it comes to schools. We wanted to include uh, high school and see how we could make advancements in that. And so um, we've been doing a lot of work this year um, with a number of different school districts. Kind of the culminating event for this year is a new engineering pathfinders camp, uh, which we are doing. It's going to be a four week summer camp for uh, rising eighth through 10th graders with the idea of giving students a snapshot of all the different areas of engineering. Uh, electrical engineering, uh, coding, structural design, um, and uh, I'm blanking on the fourth one. So uh, three mo 3D modeling and design. Um, so this is a real low key way for students to get introduced to those. I forget who was speaking earlier. Maybe it was Dr. Pariso was talking about, you know, what type of engineering to get into. We want these kids to understand what their strengths are, what they're interested in early on. So as they get to the upper levels of high school, they already have an idea of what to do. So we have had meetings. Um, uh, thanks to Ginger's uh, connections with Dr. Pariso to say, how can we take this idea and what we're wanting to do with engineering and advance it uh, in District 20 and help with the CTE initiatives that you are are so proud of and working on. Um, along with that, we started a new high school internship program uh, this year. I'm going to highlight two of our interns are from the Village High School. They are working on coding some software for one of our digital programs for high school students. Uh, this mission was funded by Lockheed Martin, and so uh, they are working on a 3D rendering of the Orion capsule. And when our Lockheed Martin uh, contact saw what they were doing, he was extremely impressed, said, we've got some proprietary software that has kind of been on the shelf. Um, and so uh, on May 7th, those individuals are going to go up to Lockheed Martin, take a look at this software. They're signing a non-disclosure uh, agreement, and they are going to be working in partnership with Lockheed Martin engineers to help us with the program, but also kind of get this uh, this uh, this program off the shelf for them. Uh, this is likely going to turn into an externship for these two students. They're seniors. Um, our Lockheed Martin representatives love what they're doing and say, we want you back, right? So this is, you know, when you talk about those career connections, these kids are invested. Uh, they're at our center two days a week working on this uh, and really hope that it turns out to uh, opportunities of, of positions with them uh, at Lockheed Martin. So just exciting things that have happened this year, uh, which I wanted to make sure that I, I shared about. Oops, I'm going to go back. So looking ahead, um, booking for next year is already opened. Our calendar fills up very quickly. So we've got over uh, 250 programs already booked for next year. Uh, because of the relationship with the district, all D20 schools get two weeks of priority booking over any other district uh, or uh, the general public there. Um, so uh, we're booking programs for next year. We've got summer camps uh, up, and uh, up and ready to go. Um, and so we'll have 15 camps at our center and on the Legacy Peak campus for students from grades first through 10th grade. Um, our teacher STEM boot camp is a uh, teacher training that we've done. This is the 14th year that we've run it. The whole idea is that we're providing STEM activities and education for elementary school teachers, but we're also providing them with resources. So if we talk about highlight a robot or a coding program, those teachers leave with classroom uh, things to take back to their classroom. So it's not just good education, but they're walking away with materials for their students. Um, kind of the last thing I want to highlight. Um, our Challenger Center, if you're not aware, is one of 36 in the Challenger network um, across, it's a nationwide network. Uh, our center here in Colorado Springs and in District 20 was the highest performing Challenger Center out of the entire network. We won the award uh, for most students served and most programs run out of any of the 36 centers to quote the president of the Challenger Center, and it wasn't even close. So we served tens of thousands of more students um, within, you know, here in Colorado Springs than any other Challenger Center. Um, I point that out because it would not be possible without the support of District 20 and the connections that we have. Um, as a part of that, we are uh, hosting, there is an annual conference for the entire network, and they have asked us to host the conference this year at our center here uh, in Colorado Springs in District 20. And so uh, one of the events of that whole week um, is a uh, kind of an awards dinner. And so I will make sure that the board, uh, as well as district leadership, gets an invite to that um, because, again, I love highlighting this is a picture perfect example of a host organization and our nonprofit and how we can work together to serve the students of this community. So, um, that is all I have for my kind of report. I want to talk quickly. Uh, I won't break out into song, uh, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you all may have for us.
Do we have questions or comments from the board? Of course. Yeah. Mr. Wilburn. Um, the national conference you just mentioned, is that a multi-day event or single day? It is. Uh, it's a multi-day event. So uh, representatives from the entire district will fly in on Sunday. It's the first week in August. I don't remember exactly. Uh, it'll be a three-day event. And so it'll highlight, um, you know, our center. You know, it's an opportunity for the for the the headquarters team to push out new information, but we'll highlight some of the things that we do specific here in Colorado. Okay. Um, the teacher boot camps, love that. Yes. Uh, do teachers pay some sort of a tuition or fee to attend? Um, yeah, so we we only charge $50 um, and it's basically no-show insurance um, because summers get busy and we want to make sure that the teachers that sign up do show up because we invest a lot of time and also buy materials for those teachers to take away. So typically our budget for that is around $50,000. Um, of that, you know, I would say all but about seven grand go to directly to teachers, classroom materials to take back. Okay, and in the report somewhere, um, yes, you'd mentioned that for the teacher boot camp, our teachers get priority booking. Yes. Before, then I think it said the general public. Is yeah. that public or is that teacher population from other districts? Um, Teacher population from other districts. Okay, so the, yeah, I can't. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we have had uh, homeschool parents asked to attend in the past, and so we've had that from time to time. So I guess general public is, you know, a, could be an accurate term, but typically um, it's it's um, you know, kind of the front range area. We have plenty of of teachers from Denver that come down, but um, you know, one of the one of the conversations we had with district leadership was, can we open that up to district twenty teachers? And I thought that uh, early, and I thought that was an incredible idea. So uh, they'll register their registration will um, open up next week with uh, the the rest of the registration the week following. So, any other questions? All right, Mr. Bush, okay. thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and please come by and see us sometime. So. Our next presentation is the preliminary revenue assumptions for fiscal year 2024 through 2025. Superintendent Haber. Deputy CFO, Ms. Becky Allen. Good evening again. Uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago on May 9th, I will present the proposed 24-25 budget to the board. Tonight's report that you have in front of you summarizes the revenue assumptions that form the foundation for that budget. Only revenue, so not talking about cuts we've made elsewhere, just what, what money are, are we looking at coming in? And for any of these assumptions, remember I bring you this budget, the new year doesn't even start for the fiscal year till until July 1. We try to get as close as we can. Please know whatever we don't hit uh, properly, our target's a little off, we receive more or less, we'll true that up in the mid-year next January tw uh, in 2025. And I'm just going to speak to a few highlights and I'd be certainly happy to take any additional questions that you have. So some of the most critical items on page two in your report, you have the information about our per pupil revenue. The 24-25 School Finance Act was passed by the Senate on April 5th and is now with the House. And based upon the bill that's being reviewed by the House when compared to this year's per pupil revenue, the one that I shared at the mid-year budget time, we're looking at an increase, as I mentioned, of about 6.98%. That's $702 per student. Now, it's important to note because this has been very publicized and this is good news, the budget stabilization factor for next year is zeroed out. So that's, we'd have $4 million budget stabilization factor this year. Um, since its inception over 10 years ago, it's almost $270 million that District 20 has not had uh, from having that budget stabilization factor. But the one thing that I do want to mention is, I don't want you to think there must be another revenue stream representing the, the absence of the budget stabilization factor. The $702 increase includes elimination of the budget stabilization factor. Um, also on page two, we talk about student enrollment. This is another critical variable because our total program funding takes our per pupil revenue times how many students. Now, I'm going to give you the projection in headcount terms. Just know from a budgeting stance, we use funded pupil count. And that, again, corresponds to two half-time students would be two headcount 
one funded pupil count or full time equivalent. And remember that our funded pupil count does not include preschool because that has a different funding mechanism now. So we are projecting a decrease of about 103 students headcount next year. This reflects New Summit, TCA, and the non-charters. Now, why? Why would we be projecting that? Well, what we've seen um, in 1920, we were at 26603. And it's amazing because this count year 26607, Last year looks like a typo, but it's for real, 26,607. In between there, our enrollment did a dip. So with COVID in 2021, we went down to 25,711 and we've been climbing back. But when I look at 1920, I look at this year and last year, it's right around that 26,607. And so that is where we're, our projection is not as high as it was, and we need to get down to something that is just more reasonable with the birth rates that we're seeing. Those birth rates are lower in the county. The cost of living is more. Some of our older neighborhoods are aging out. We don't have as many families going to those, and as prices go up, it just gets harder to access. We've also seen following COVID, just a greater variety of non-traditional educational experiences for families that they, they are pursuing. So for all of those reasons, that's what we're looking at. Now, the funded pupil count has a larger de decrease when you look in my report. That is because this year our funded pupil count is artificially higher because of averaging that is done at the state level. It is very difficult, no matter the, the conversations I've had with CDE, to tell me exactly what could my averaged response be next year. They say, well, we don't have, so I'm conservative about that. I don't want to overestimate all of this averaging, and if that doesn't come through, then we have overprojected our revenue. So we take a conservative approach with that and to make sure that we wait and see what CDE calculates as our averaging. Um, on page three in item eight, what you see is just, uh, uh, again, just explaining our new revenue from School Finance Act. Here you see a little bit more detail than what I pre presented during the work session and a few minutes ago. We are netting, the non-charters are netting about 13.3, but the overall increase is 15.9 million, but a little over two and a half million of those dollars go to TCA and New Summit. So again, please note any significant changes as, as these come into the budget between now and May 9th, if it's significant, I will share them with you. And anything that doesn't true up exactly to what we've shared, we'll true it up at the mid-year January 2025. But this gives you a glimpse into what you'll see um, on May 9th. Any questions for me? Mr. Chair, <clears throat> um, with number seven, Yes. Talking about the um, investment interest income. Yes. Um, seeing how the interest rates don't appear to be going down, do you anticipate additional investment interest income during the mid-year budget like we had this past year? Yeah. So, uh, great question. Um, we use two investments, by the way, Colo Trust and CSIP, if folks didn't know that. I'm going to be honest, before I got into this role of CFO, I'm not sure that I would have known that. And they're interest-bearing accounts so that we're not just letting our money sit somewhere that it's earning, but there's very safe investments. And so at the mid-year, because of the high interest rates, we went ahead and did a one-time increase for $1.75 million to our revenue for this year. Again, taking a conservative approach, we marked it as one time, and we're, we're projecting next year $2 million total, but if interest rates are slow to fall, then we certainly could have another increase in our revenue due to interest income, and I would bring that amount to you as a one-time adjustment in January. As tempting as it is to make it recurring, if the bottom drops out, then I would overestimate the revenue. Yeah, no, that's good. And then just um, curios curiosity, uh, what interest rate do you use to set the baseline? We look at it more historically over time. Typically, the the numbers that we're using right now that we're seeing are about five and a half percent, five point four percent. 
but sometimes we look at it over time. Like in 21, 22, we only had $200,000 of income. Then it spiked in 22, 23. So we, we focus probably a little less. It's kind of a combination of the trend and what we uh, earned in interest over that prior year. So we, we make our best guess, again, from a conservative approach on that number, looking at both of those things. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'm waiting to be recognized. Yes. Oh, Mr. Wilburn. <laughs> uh, so does interest income right now get, uh, when it's realized, does it get pushed back into principal or do we draw that down? Uh, we bring that as other revenue for interest income and it basically at the end of the year, it, if it hasn't gone, gone to cover something else, it becomes part of our unassigned fund balance. Is that it for Ms. Allen? OK, right. thank you so thank much. You. Our next presentation uh, is our legislative update. Superintendent Heber. Yes, would Mrs. Tanya Thompson, our general counsel, please come up. Thank you. I feel like Ms. Allen's been teasing my presentation all night, so I'm here to completely underwhelm you with <laughs> with what I have to share. Um, so we are approaching, we, we are in the final home stretch of our legislative session for the, the 24, uh, 2024 legislative session that started on January 10th. It's set to adjourn on May 8th. And so if you count, we have 21 calendar days. Um, that's roughly three weeks to get everything done. And if you just consider that in terms of work days, if our legislators are not willing to go in for sessions on Saturdays and Sundays, they really only have 14 days left to get everything accomplished that they sought to do. So in this session, so far we've had over 600 bills introduced. And in Colorado, we each bill that gets introduced gets a hearing. So a lot of these bills that have been introduced have been going through committee meetings, um, sometimes uh, amendments back to committee. Um, once they pass out of committee, they will go on to the other side. So if they're introduced in the House, they pass out of the House committee, they go to the Senate and the process starts over. If there are amendments, it then has to go back to the House side to be re-reviewed and then vice versa. If it starts in the Senate, same process. So right now is the t point in time where we're seeing some things passing on, getting signed by the, the governor, but we still have a lot of work being done in committees. So what I wanted to share with you is just an update on some of the things um, that have been introduced. For example, we all know that we've navigated a staffing shortage over the course of the last few years, um, especially in areas related to specialized service providers. That's our school psychologists, our speech language, our OTs, our PTs. Um, we simply can't hire enough. We look to outside service provider or outside contracted services in order to make sure we have sufficient service providers. So in Colorado, I think our legislature has worked really hard. And so I commend their efforts to try to help us with just getting licensure um, for folks, if you look at House Bill 1002, um, really trying to accomplish reciprocity for social workers that want to come into the state of Colorado, provide their services, um, and have a more streamlined path for licensure with Colorado Department of Education. There's also a companion bill, which is 1096, and that is pretty much seeks to accomplish the same thing for school psychologists. So both of those bills were introduced in the House. They've gone on to the Senate. They've passed. So they are, in theory, on their way to the governor's desk for, uh, for approval. Um, we have yet to determine uh, whether or not the, the easing of the burdens of licensure will actually help make staffing those positions easier, but we can certainly hope. The next bill I'll talk about is 1044. This was a para bill that we talked about in my last presentation that sought to allow para retirees to return to a district in Colorado, be hired without a reduction in their retiree benefits. Um, and 
there are some certain criteria, but nonetheless, just to make it to where districts can hire them back into the workforce to serve in the positions that are hard to fill without penalty to the retiree. Uh, that was actually sent to the governor on April 10th. So that is progressing. That's good news for our retirees that are not yet quite ready to call it quits or, or is willing. They've taken some time off and may be willing to come back and help out. Um, so 1096, I just mentioned um, around school psychologist licensure and, and interstate compact for reciprocity as they come in to serve in the state of Colorado. That too has passed the House it's passed the Senate and it's on its way with no amendments. Um, the next bill I'll talk about is tw uh, 241296, House Bill 1296. This is a seeks to modify the Colorado Open Records Act and it gives some additional leeway to public agencies to um, to work with the, the, the public transparency and try to make it a little bit more manageable in uh, fielding the requests. It also allows um, the, the custodians to deem someone a vexatious requester and bar a person from obtaining records within for 30 days uh, under this particular bill. It's right now um, laid over daily, so I don't know. I don't know if it's going to pass out of House committee and make it, but it's we've got three weeks left, so we'll continue to watch. Um, before I'm going to go a little bit out of order, I'm going to talk about Senate Bill 188 and Senate Bill 188. I, I'm not going to spend much time on it all because Miss Allen has already given you the gist of what came through that's the long bill of the school finance act so the long bill was was approved it has has made its way through we now have some clarity as to what that's going to to mean to us with our um, funding and so uh, it's that was just yesterday that it was um, referred unamended to appropriations so that is good news the bill that i think miss Allen has has been teasing this evening is House Bill 1448. Our school funding formula in the state of Colorado is over 30 years old, so it's a bit antiquated and um, I, our legislatures have recognized that modernization is is necessary. Uh, they, they want to make school funding across the state of Colorado a bit more equitable and so I commend the efforts of Representatives McCluskey and Bacon, as well as Senator Lundeen and uh, Senator Zenzinger for doing a lot of work on this particular bill to try to work with the, the committee to determine whether or not they could bring forward something that was a viable option for reconstructing our funding formula. Um, so, in 1448, um, it is it is a dense bill. The fiscal note is is also um, gives a lot of in information as well. But this new funding school finance funding formula seeks to restructure starting fiscal year 25-26. So a, a little bit further down the road, not this next fiscal year, but really seeks to restructure the distribution of, of our school funding across our state. The, when, when the work group was created or uh, the, um, the study group was created that gave their report in December, um, there was also a mandate of adequacy studies to ensure that whatever was being contemplated had some form of sustainability over time. Um, right now, 1448 would seek to give um, more credit, if you will, in, in the formula to special populations um, such as your um, English language learners, your um, free and reduced, um, 
demographics. And so in this funding formula, districts like Academy District 20, who does does not, we're a large, comparatively, a larger district at 26,000 students. Um, we have um, a fairly low ELL population, that's English language learners population. Um, our uh, at-risk populations are, um, I don't want to say minimal, but they we don't have substantial numbers of those populations that would carry or benefit Academy District 20 in the recalculation under this new formula. So I am going to ask Mrs. Allen or Superintendent Haberer to weigh in because you guys have given Ms. Uh, Senator McCluskey some feedback on this bill and the implications for our district. So Ms. Allen, do you want to talk about your meeting with uh, um, Ms. McCluskey, uh, Representative McCluskey? And so Bard, one of the reasons why we want to highlight this is we belong to the Pikes Peak Alliance and they have reached out to Becky and to me to say, what is your stance on this bill? And the bill, uh, the formula has changed quite a bit. When it first came out, they did what a two to three year run where they show you kind of over several years, what would that mean for District 20? And the first one that came out was going to cost us a significant amount of money. What was it? Close to $11 million, right? Would have been an $11 million hit to D20. Um, they got more feedback at the legislature. They went back uh, and the folks that uh, Tanya mentioned, they, they said, okay, let's relook at this formula. So then just recently, like what, one or two days or one day ago, or a couple of days ago, they came out with another spreadsheet. I tried to send it to you and the, the technology wasn't allowing it to go through uh, just because it was such a large file. But um, the second run, we uh, pretty much stayed flat. So we were at about, uh, we would make maybe $23 uh, more per student uh, with that funding, but it only went out a couple of years. It was a little discouraging though, because when we looked at other districts, they were getting, you know, over a hundred dollars or more uh, gain and we were getting 23. So when we talked about it, we had a chance to talk to uh, Director Aaron Salt the other day and we were kind of saying, okay, well, what would that stance be? And uh, we were kind of, you know, going back and forth to, do we just oppose it? If we do that, there's a risk especially with only 14 days left, that they could go back and say, okay, well, you know what, let's just go back to what we had, which would be worse for us. We would get more of a cut. Or it could go the other way. It could be, okay, let's go back and refigure. Um, Becky and I have looked at it, but especially Becky with all the CFOs, and we're the lowest funded district in the state. And the chance of us, if they did go back again and try to recalculate things, the chance of us getting the same kind of increase as the other districts would probably still be pretty slim. So uh, I think it was yesterday we talked about it. We said, well, for right now, let's just monitor it. In other words, we're just going to stay neutral right now. Let's monitor it because there's been so many different changes. And um, Becky had a chance, and I want to thank you for that again, for getting on the call with uh, uh, McCluskey. Uh, yeah, so go ahead. Thank yeah, that, that was a great summary, um, Ms. Thompson, Superintendent Haber, thank you. So when we first saw, saw you know, um, Speaker McCluskey's plan, you look at it through the lens. Part of that lens is thinking back to December when we saw the work of the task force and we saw a significant cut. It was based on what the governor had forecasted our, our um, revenue, our per pupil revenue to be next year. We were supposed to get on what the governor said back in November, 13.6 million under this new thing from the task force, $11 million less, only 2 million. That is significant. So then when you look at McCluskey's bill, that's the first place we go, right? What is our hit? And when we look at it, we just have one year's data. Um, it This new piece is implemented over six years, but the puzzle pieces we have aren't quite the whole puzzle. We have, we're getting a little bit more puzzle pieces every day, but we haven't seen all six years of the run. But um, as Superintendent Haberer mentioned, when you compare what we would get under the current formula 
and what we would get under the new, it's a difference of about $23. And as Superintendent Haberer mentioned, some other districts, it's significant. I want to just give you some examples. Um, $23 increase for District 20, Cheyenne Mountain, 78, Fountain Fort, Fort Carson, $313, District 11, 126, Lewis Palmer, 59, D49 is $78. Now, when we look at it, we say, okay, one, these numbers are at least holding somewhat steady instead of a decline. And then we always come to these challenges from, I think, Superintendent Haber and myself, of what conversation can we engage in? And see, we said, let's stay neutral, monitor. And I had the opportunity to be a part of a conversation with uh, Speaker McCluskey and share some of the con concerns or questions. One, more years of data. Um, two, some type of assurance that our dollars would at least keep up with the rate of inflation that our constitution in Colorado says that the base per pupil funding must be increased by at least the rate of inflation each year. Those were the pieces that we've been able to engage in some of this dialogue. Because if as that gap widens between District 20 and other districts in our funding, that, same, that where we're gonna see that the most is in the area where we spend the most money and about 74 to 75% of that is salaries and benefits. So when we think about the temperature of where we wanna land on this, again, it's been a neutral trying to gather information, also thinking, okay, um, you know, we didn't go down a lot. So that's, that's a reason to stay neutral. Now, as things are getting more and more towards the end of the time here in the session, people are asking more about where does District 20 stand? And as Superintendent Haberer shared, I was on a Pikes Peak Alliance meeting this morning, all of the other school districts on the call oppose the bill. Why would someone oppose it or, or a district oppose it? Well, one would be that what we see is that the gap in funding, uh, according to this single run of one year, would widen between District 20 and other districts. Now, I have to be honest with you. I don't know that changing the School Finance Act formula, especially based on factors like at-risk, ELL, we have impacted students in all of those areas. But when you look at our large school district, relatively speaking to other school districts, we simply don't fare in gathering a lot of additional revenue for those items. I think that we're, we're floor funded now, meaning we're at the bottom. I'm not trying to be negative, but I don't see a lot of scenarios that push us significantly out of that area of the funding in the state. So certainly an increased gap would be a reason that someone might say I oppose it. Another one might be we've asked for extensive years. Give me runs all six years. We have not seen those yet. Someone might say, what's the rush? This funding over a School Finance Act formula would not be implemented next year. It would be the following year. So some are saying, why don't we take more time to do more adequacy studies to see that the funding is in place now that the budget stabilization factor is gone. Let's not get into a situation where that could come back. So those are some of the reasons that other school districts are saying, I'd like to go ahead, we're gonna oppose that particular piece. Um, with the rate of inflation, uh, it, it hasn't appeared in all of the bills. I just look at the language. The latest version does state that the Colorado Constitution requires the base uh, per pupil funding to increase by the rate of at least inflation, but I don't, I can't say that I've seen it in the formula. It could be there. It's just I don't have all of those details. So that's kind of where we are right now. That's some reasons why someone uh, might decide a district is going to stay neutral versus one that might say we're going to oppose. So Barb, we just want to bring this to you just to kind of take your temperature in, in case you wanted to, to weigh in on that because right now you know, we have said, but we just want to monitor it and we haven't really taken a position either way. And we haven't really had a chance like this uh, to be able to take the temperature with all board members. Mrs. Yunus, 
OK, so the how does the twenty three dollar increase in per pupil funding compare to the rate, the five point two percent rate of inflation um, right now? It's at, from what we can see and it's this section. So the last four pages of that PDF document have these very small charts and what what the chart looks like is this. So it starts here with what the current law would give you in year 25, 26. Then it says here, here's what the new law would give. Over here is the change between those two. So in other words, when it tells me what I would get in the current law, that's increased by 2.6%, which is the CPI projected for a year from now. So we see that in there. Then this formula, it's saying it'd give us $23 more. So that's the $23. It's not just $23 over what we have now. The 23 in this run represents how much more the new formula would have given over what we currently have. over the CPI at that time. Some districts say, Becky, I haven't seen the formulas. I'm not convinced it's getting rate of inflation. When I do the math for all these districts, I keep getting 2.6%, 2.6%, 2.6%. And that is what they're predicting CPI to be for the future. But what some would say who oppose, let me see more details on this and let me see multiple years. That's what some would say. And this chart that is being referenced is actually in the fiscal note. So if anybody is online wants to see this chart that we're referencing, it is the last few pages of the fiscal note of House Bill 1448. Ms. Thompson, I just didn't know if you wanted to continue yeah. any more. Or Really, this this was the grand finale. Okay. Um, <laughs> I told you it was <laughs> expecting more. <laughs> exactly. I said like it was going to be underwhelming, and I did not disappoint. Um, but really, the thing to keep in mind is that um, the way the way it's currently drafted is a six year glide path to full implementation of this, and so with one year's project projection as to what the implication will be for a district like ours. It's very hard to the, nobody has the crystal ball. I understand, but one year's projection I think is very short sighted to know what this is going to mean. It's also that one year projection is based on our current enrollment numbers. And as was previously reported, We've had some fluctuation in those numbers since 2019. And so those averages could go up and just like they could go down. And so $23 is not a lot um, of reliance um, when we're trying to figure out ways to increase salaries and recurring costs in the district and build budgets. Any other question? Quick, oh. Yeah, I do. I have a quick question, and this is probably more for Miss Allen. Um, the currently there's a, a rolling average if enrollment begins to drop. Would this finance formula interfere or change that rolling average as far as state funding goes? Mr. Salt, first of all, I'm sorry that you don't feel well. Um, second, uh, what we have heard is that the five year rolling average would go to four. OK. Thank you. And just I mentioned this to Ms. Haber earlier. Um, I did reach out to a couple of our state reps um, that were, we were talking about this bill specifically because they had heard that we were. In a different status than the neutral status that we were trying to take and they were trying to get clarification. And one of the things that I told them that would help us would be actually codifying that inflationary increase to the floor. And so they said that was a very helpful piece of feedback. I said, I think some of the other districts might appreciate having that codified as well and not just relying on the state legislature to do, you know, follow the rules. So 
just wanted to Thank pass you. that along to you since we hadn't had a chance to chat. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Cons. Okay. I think that's it for this item. Oh, Mrs. Yanez. Are we at the point where I can ask about another bill? <laughs> okay. Um, there was one that I was tracking um, the last time we had a legislative update, which by the way, I don't think any legislative update has a grand finale ever. Just kidding. <laughs> I love that you love them. I stand here and just am in awe. Okay. Uh, House Bill 1221. It's the income tax credit for eligible teachers. The last time I checked that one, so this has um, March 4th. It was um, sitting in appro uh, appropriations. It's still there. That's not a good sign. Yeah, this this particular bill um, tends to stall out. And if a bill stalls out and doesn't get the attention to progress, it will die on the clock. So this may be one of those that dies on the clock. This is really surprising to me because there's been one released, um, I think two years ago for um, early uh, childhood educators, um, but I haven't seen the same for eligible teachers for, for K-12. So hopefully it'll get picked up again. Yes. Ms. Cons. Yes. Uh, how about 1039, House Bill 1039? Where, where is it sitting? Um, so it was in the House, it went over to the Senate, there were some amendments in the Senate, and then it's now back in the House. They've concurred, meaning they've adopted the Senate's amendments, and so it's repassed and it's on its way to, to becoming law. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Thank you. Oh, I have to turn my microphone back on. We have come to public comment section. Uh, first off, I want to give a warm welcome to Mark Belcher, who is our new Chief Communications Officer, and it's his first board meeting. Welcome. Thank you. Much appreciated. <laughs> and he gets to be the star of the show now, so. <laughs> I think our commenters are the stars of the show. We do have four individuals registered for public comment, two for our section one. Uh, first up will be Amity, me, Amity Lynch. Before we call her up, sure. just one second. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and since we do not have any decision items on our agenda tonight, our two public comment sections will flow together. So I'll read our preamble once, uh, the fine print, but it applies to both public comment sections. The board welcomes the comments of our community members. Speakers must sign up prior to 1 p.m. via an online form, and they must limit the remarks to two minutes or less. In deference to ASD 20 students, students will be allowed to speak first during the first public comment section. Following any students, speakers who wish to comment on an agenda item will be called in order of sign up. We greatly value all comments from the public, but in order to adhere to board policy and accomplish the work already on the agenda, the board will not respond at the meeting. Speakers may offer appreciation for or criticism of school operations and programs as concern them, but are encouraged to exercise their speech rights responsibly as they are personally responsible for any legal consequences attributable to their comments, including claims for defamation. Please keep in mind that students often attend board meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be suitable for an audience that includes kindergarten through 12th grade students, including no use of profanities or obscenities. Comments concerning personnel matters should be directed to the superintendent or board president in writing with your signature. Supplemental written materials can be given to our security guards and they'll be delivered to the board secretary. The board president, or tonight, Vice President will recognize each speaker and consistent with GP 4.04, comments will be curtailed if remarks or behavior becomes inappropriate. The Board President, Vice President may interrupt, warn or terminate a speaker's statement that is unrelated to the business of the school district, inappropriate for students or disruptive to an orderly, civil and productive meeting. And I just want to say that um, on behalf of the community, we've had very productive time together the last several meetings so from my heart to all of yours thank you for that and just if you're new or haven't been to a board meeting in a while we have gone to just using our silent claps asl claps just so you guys know that that's changed lately and now 
Mr. Belcher, we are ready. Thank you. Thanks and sorry for my eagerness. All right, so first up we have Amity Lynch on. Uh, uh, next up would be Jeremy Beckman. In the hole would be Tim Hoffman. All right, good evening board, Superintendent Haber. I am a mom of two D20 students, a D20 resident and a D20 employee. I came here straight from soccer after going to soccer straight from school because I do it for the kids and competitive staff pay is important. Quality staff matters for my students and my own children. And while I am here for the students, I still have to provide for my own family. Please reject and send back EL 2.7.3 for revision to account for the same market that you use for our administrative staff. At a time when educators are leaving the profession in droves, D20 should be doing everything possible to keep exceptional teachers and support staff. You have an opportunity to uphold your campaign promises by not only authorizing an annual raise to help ease the pain of inflation and our local rising cost of living in Colorado Springs, you also have an opportunity to keep pay competitive for the long haul by adjusting this policy. With 39 million in D20 funding reserves and an anticipated 7.1% increase in School Finance Act funding, you have the means to do the right thing and increase staff salaries by a competitive rate. The question is, will you? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. Next up, we have Jeremy Beckman. Tim Hoffman is on deck and Brett Dayberry is in the hole. Good evening, board. I'm Jeremy Beckman speaking for AEA and as a parent. First, I'd like to thank all the D20 Battle of the Book coaches. It was an inspiring day to see so many fifth graders competing over books today. Special thanks to my daughter's coaches, Ashley Hartnett and Erica Bose from DCC Elementary. I appreciate Dr. Smart for proposing changes to EL 2.7 and being willing to talk to us over the last year. However, I urge our district to adjust to the admin professional market in EL 2.7. Number one, teachers are professionals too. And number two, it's working really, really well. If we adjust to the geographic, the admin will continue to keep the professional market they currently have, including Denver and Cherry Creek for years because their salaries have already been adjusted to the top quartile of that professional market and the percentage-based raises we get off of uh, ND20 would be based off of these professional market salaries already. And I don't think we are proposing readjusting salaries down to the newly defined geographic markets if we go in that direction. The gap that exists between the teacher and the admin professional markets would continue to be there for those working groups that does not match the current needs of our district. It will be hard to make our budget work for this. I'm willing to help and great things happen in D20 when we do hard things for our students. Here's the reason why we need it now. Number one, as of this moment, there is one administrative job open in D20. There are 144 teaching jobs open. That's 0.5% of our admin FTE and about 9% of our teaching FTE. And this isn't a 9% turnover rate. This is 9% still open for next year. This shows that the admin professional market works well for D20. Let's make it the classroom professional market as well. And why the urgency? This year is the last year D20 should anticipate a large increase in funding from the state, as Ms. Allen mentioned, and we need to use it strategically for our students. I agree with the board ends that we need to run this district like a business, and this is a perfect place to start. A business would adjust these markets ASAP to match supply and demand with, an appro with a proven effective market. While this interpretation is the way we've always done things in D20, and that can feel really safe, I take this board's word at their. Thank you, Mr. Beckman. Next up is Tim Hoffman with Brett Dayberry to follow. Hey, Tim Hoffman. <clears throat> I sent most of you an email this week detailing an opportunity for growth in the space of child safety. I got an email acknowledging it, and I really, truly hope you guys took advantage of it. Child safety is super important to me, as it should be to everybody, but especially those in the roles that you guys are in. I often joke I'm one of the safest people to leave your kids with. After five international adoptions and holding multiple roles in large organizations that focus on the safety of kids, I've been background checked, fingerprinted, and vetted more times than I can count. And yet I still take the time to review and grow and learn in that space every year. Given the behavior we've seen from some here, I would think that encouraging your peers who are less astute on child safety to learn more so they can be safer for kids would be a priority. I hope it is. 
Prior to my family moving to Colorado Springs 10 plus years ago, we did a ton of research on which district was the B district to be in. And you know what kept coming up? District 20 over and over again. That was 10 years ago. I tried to remember those results last night as my wife and I attended an information session at Mountain Ridge Middle School. Afterwards, we talked with staff, teachers, and students and took a tour of the building. The environment was exciting and encouraging. When I suspend my belief of what this board has done to damage the district's reputation, it's easy to see why a place such as Mountain Ridge would be a place families would choose to go. I want to give a specific shout out to the SPED team there. We engaged with Tiana Clark and Sherry Fuller to discuss IEPs and our son's potential transfer. They were awesome and the work they're doing there is special. We look forward to getting to know the rest of the team as well. A shout out to the teachers who came up to me and thanked me for doing this, speaking on their behalf. Before we left, we walked down this one hall. It has an amazing view of Pikes Peak. It's incredible. Have you guys seen that view? I sat there and looked at it, and I couldn't help but think how much more beautiful it would be if those of you on this board who truly care would encourage your peers who have no place on this board to voluntarily resign and loosen the district from the liability that they are. Seriously, you guys, do the right thing. Let's try to return this district to the greatness of the Google searches from 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Next up is Brett Dayberry. First Timothy 520 reads, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. As for you, Nicole, Lauren, and Aaron, each of whom has voted the last two board meetings to keep porn in our libraries, I rebuke you. I call you out in the presence of all and for your persistence of sin. Integrity is a word that has been thrown around a lot recently, but not followed. I know from past conversations that at least four out of five of you believe these books to be vile and inappropriate for school libraries. I only say four out of five because the fifth board member, Aaron Salt, hasn't shown the courage to make any statement one way or the other. So let's look at some of the facts. It's well established that this board is not only has the authority but also has the responsibility to determine what books are in the libraries. Number two, the majority of these board members are against these books being in the libraries. Each board member professes to be, quote, for the kids. And yet these books remain. That is not integrity. Here's another word, accountability. Are the three of you being accountable to the kids? Nope. Are the three of you being accountable to a lot of the people in this room that work their butts off to put you on this board? Nope. Who are the three of you being accountable to? Maybe that's the real question. One's mind could easily begin to wonder if it might be some rather nefarious groups or individuals. Show some integrity. Be accountable. Do what is right by the kids. Thank you, Mr. Dayberry. That concludes our public comment sections. I would like to give a warm happy birthday to Rich Payne. There he is. <laughs> April 29th. Clarification and our next step, Superintendent Haber, do you have any? No, I do not. Thank you. Team, our debrief was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. Did the board hear information tonight that would require the review or revision of a policy? Did the board hear information tonight that would require a new policy? Did the board hear information tonight that the board would like to include on a future agenda? Okay. Um, Mrs. Matson Bonet, how many people are still on our live stream? 42. Thank you, 42 people. Our next item is an executive session. We need a motion that the Board of Education convene an executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 
246402-4B to confer with an attorney for the board for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions related to potential and pending litigation matters. While in executive session, the board will not adopt any proposed policy, resolution, regulation, or take any formal action. Lastly, the Colorado Open Meetings Law does not require the board to make record of the executive session in which the attorney is present and providing legal advice per CRS 246402-2D.5. I, I, B. Do we have a motion? Note. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Kahns? Aye. Mrs. Shandy? Aye. Mr. Wilburn? Aye. Mrs. Ginez? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. The executive session will be held in the superintendent's office and invited to this executive session are Ms. Allen, Dr. Field, Mrs. Haberer, myself, Mrs. Kahns, Dr. Lujan Lindsay, Mr. Salt, virtually, Mrs. Shandy, Colonel Stallworth, Mrs. Thompson, Mr. Wilburn, Mrs. Yanez, and Mr. Smart. The regular portion of the meeting is over. We will take a quick break to clear the room and move to the superintendent's office. <laughs> 